College English Test, Band 4, Part 2, Listening Comprehension. Section A, Directions. In this section, you will hear three news reports. At the end of each news report, you will hear two or three questions. Both the news report and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C and D. Then, mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1, with a single line through the centre. News Report 1 A nine-year-old Central California boy braved strong currents and cold water to swim from San Francisco to Alcatraz Island and back. A California television station in Fresno reported Tuesday that James Savage set a record as the youngest swimmer to make the journey to the former prison. The TV station reported that by completing the swim, the fourth grade student from Los Baños broke a record previously held by a 10-year-old boy. James said that waves in the San Francisco Bay hitting him in the face 30 minutes into his swim made him want to give up. His father said he had offered his son $100 as a reward. To encourage his struggling son, he doubled it to $200. James pushed forward, making it to Alcatraz Island and back in a little more than two hours. Alcatraz is over a mile from the mainland. Questions 1 and 2 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 1. What did the boy from Central California do according to the report? Question 2. What did the father do to encourage his son? News Report 2 On the 1st of January, new regulations will come into effect which eliminate an annual leave bonus for people who put off marrying until the age of 23 for women and 25 for men, the South China Morning Post reports. The holiday bonus was designed to encourage young people to delay getting married in line with China's one-child policy. But with that policy now being abolished, this holiday incentive is no longer necessary, the government says. In Shanghai, a young couple at a marriage registration office told the paper that they decided to register their marriage as soon as possible to take advantage of the existing policy, because an extra holiday was a big deal for them. In Beijing, one registration office had about 300 couples seeking to get married the day after the changes were announced rather than the usual number of between 70 and 80. But one lawyer tells the paper that the changes still have to be adopted by local governments, and these procedures take time. So people who are rushing to register for marriage can relax. Questions 3 and 4 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 3. What was the purpose of the annual leave bonus in China? Question 4. What do we learn about the new regulations? News Report 3 Everyone loves a good house party, but the cleaning up the next morning isn't as enjoyable. Now, however, 
a New Zealand-based startup company, aims to bring messy homes and even splitting headaches back to normal. The properly named startup Morning After Maids was launched about a month ago in Auckland by roommates Rebecca Foley and Catherine Ashurst. Aside from cleaning up, the two will also cook breakfast and even get coffee and painkillers for recovering merrymakers. Although they are both gainfully employed, they fit cleaning jobs into their nights and weekends, which is when their service is in most demand anyway. Besides being flooded with requests from across the country, Foley and Ashurst have also received requests from the U.S. and Canada to provide services there. They are reportedly meeting with lawyers to see how best to take the business forward. Questions 5 to 7 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 5. What is the news report mainly about? Question 6. What is a common problem with a house party? Question 7. What are Rebecca Foley and Catherine Ashurst planning to do? Section B. Directions. In this section, you will hear two long conversations. At the end of each conversation, you will hear four questions. Both the conversation and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet one with a single line through the center. Conversation one. Kyle, how did your driver's theory exam go? It was yesterday, right? Yes, I prepared as much as I could, but I was so nervous since it was my second try. The people who worked at the test center were very kind though. We had a little conversation which calmed me down a bit and that was just what I needed. Then, after the exam, they printed out my result, but I was afraid to open it until I was outside. It was such a relief to pass. Congratulations. I knew you could do it. I guess you underestimated how difficult it would be the first time, didn't you? I hear a lot of people make that mistake and go in underprepared. But good job in passing the second time. I'm so proud of you. Now, all you have to do next is your road test. Have you had any lessons yet? Yes, thanks. I'm so happy to be actually on the road now. I've only had two driving lessons so far, and my instructor is very understanding. So, I'm really enjoying it, and I can't wait for my next session although the lessons are rather expensive. Twenty pounds an hour, and the instructor says I'll need about thirty to forty lessons in total. That's what? Six to eight hundred pounds. So this time I'll need to make a lot more effort and hopefully will be successful the first time. Well, good luck. Questions eight to eleven are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question 8. What did the man do yesterday? Question 9. Why did he fail the exam the first time?
Question 10. What does the man say about his driving lessons? Question 11. What does the man hope to do next? Conversation 2. Emma, I got accepted to the University of Leeds. Since you're going to university in England, do you know how much it is for international students to study there? Congratulations. Yes, I believe for international students, you'll have to pay around £13,000 a year. It's just a bit more than the local students. OK, so that's about $17,000 for the tuition and fees. Anyway, I'm only going to be there for a year, doing my master's. So it's pretty good. If I stayed in the U.S., it'd take two years and cost at least $50,000 in tuition alone. Also, I have a good chance of winning a scholarship at Leeds, which would be pretty awesome. The benefits of being a music genius. Yeah, I heard you're a talented piano player. So you're doing a postgraduate degree now? I'm still in my last year graduating next June. Finally, I'll be done with my studies and could go on to earning loads of money. Are you still planning on being a teacher? No money in that job, then. You'd be surprised. I'm still going to be a teacher, but the plan is to work at an international school overseas after I get a year or so of experience in England. It's better pay and I get to travel, which reminds me I'm late for my class, and I've got some documents I need to print out first. I'd better run. Questions 12 to 15 are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question 12. What does the man want to know? Question 13. What is the man going to do? Question 14. What might qualify the man for a scholarship at Leeds University? Question 15. What is the woman planning to do after graduation? Section C. Directions. In this section, you will hear three passages. At the end of each passage, you will hear three or four questions. Both the passage and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet one with a single line through the center. Passage one. Scientists have identified thousands of known ant species around the world, and only a few of them bug humans. Most ants live in the woods or out in nature. There, they keep other creatures in check, distribute seeds, and clean dead and decaying materials from the ground. A very small percentage of ants do harm to humans but those are incredibly challenging to control. They are small enough to easily slip inside your house, live in colonies that number in the tens of thousands, 
to the hundreds of thousands and reproduce quickly. That makes them good at getting in and hard to kick out. Once they settle in, these insects start affecting your home. In addition to biting ants, other species can cause different kinds of damage. Some, like carpenter ants, can undermine a home structure, while others interfere with electrical units. Unfortunately, our homes are very attractive to ants, because they provide everything the colony needs to survive, such as food, water and shelter. So how can we prevent ants from getting into our homes? Most important of all, avoid giving ants any access to food, particularly sugary food, because ants have a sweet tooth. We also need to clean up spills as soon as they occur and store food in airtight containers. Even garbage attracts ants, so empty your trash as often as possible and store your outside garbage in a lidded can well away from doors and windows. Questions 16 to 18 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 16. What does the passage say about ants? Question 17. What do we learn from the passage about carpenter ants? Question 18. What can we do to prevent ants from getting into our homes? Passage 2. My research focus is on what happens to our immune system as we age. So the job of the immune system is to fight infections. It also protects us from viruses and from autoimmune diseases. We know that as we get older, it's easier for us to get infections. So older adults have more chances of falling ill. This is evidence that our immune system really doesn't function so well when we age. In most of our work, when we're looking at older adults who've got an illness, we always have to have health controls. So we work very closely with a great group of volunteers called the 1000 Elders. These volunteers are all 65 or over, but in good health. They come to the university to provide us with blood samples, to be interviewed, and to help us carry out a whole range of research. The real impact of our research is going to be on health in old age. At the moment, we're living much longer. Life expectancy is increasing at two years for every decade. That means an extra five hours a day. I want to make sure that older adults are still able to enjoy their old age and that they're not spending time in hospital with infections, feeling unwell, and being generally weak. We want people to be healthy, even when they are old. Questions 19 to 21 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 19. What is the focus of the speaker's research? Question 20. What are the volunteers asked to do in the research? Question 21. What does the speaker say will be the impact of his research?
Passage 3 When Ted Komada started teaching 14 years ago at Killip Elementary, he didn't know how to manage a classroom and was struggling to connect with students. He noticed a couple of days after school that a group of kids would get together to play chess. I know how to play chess. Let me go and show these kids how to do it, he said. Now, Kamada coaches the school's chess team. The whole program started as a safe place for kids to come after school. And this week, dozens of those students are getting ready to head out to Nashville, Tennessee, to compete with about 5,000 other young people at the Super Nationals of Chess. The competition only happens every four years, and the last time the team went, they won the third place in the nation. Kamada says chess gives him and his students control. The school has the highest number of kids from low-income families. Police frequent the area day and night, as two months ago a young man was shot just down the street. Kamada likes to teach his students that they should think about their move before they do it. The lessons prove valuable outside the classroom as well. Many parents see these lessons translate into the real world. Students are more likely to think about their actions and see whether they will lead to trouble. Questions 22 to 25 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 22. What did Ted Komara notice one day after he started teaching at Killip Elementary? Question 23. What are dozens of students from Komada's school going to do this week? Question 24. What do we learn about the students of Killip Elementary? Question 25. What have the students learned from Kamada? This is the end of listening comprehension. College English Test Band 4 Part 2 Listening Comprehension Section A. Directions. In this section, you will hear three news reports. At the end of each news report, you will hear two or three questions. Both the news report and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C and D. Then, mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1, with a single line through the center. News Report 1 France is facing potentially more than $1 billion in lost revenue this year due to huge declines in tourism. Safety concerns have been one of the biggest reasons why the country has lost over half a billion in revenue already in the first six months of 2016. The terror attacks in Paris last November were called Europe's worst in the past decade. Besides violence, workers' strikes and heavy floods are said to have also been why international tourists have stayed away. So far in the Paris region, there's been a 46% decline in Japanese visitors, 35% fewer Russians, and 27% fewer Italians. American travelers seem the least affected. Their numbers have only dropped by roughly 5%.
According to the French government, the country is the number one tourist destination in the world, and tourism is extremely important to the French economy. The sector represents roughly 9% of its GDP. The head of Paris's tourism board said, It's time to realize that the tourism sector is going through an industrial disaster. Questions 1 and 2 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 1. What accounts most for the huge declines in tourism in France? Question 2. What do we learn from the report about tourism in France? News Report 2. A small plane with two sick U.S. workers arrived safely in Chile late Wednesday after leaving Antarctica in a daring rescue mission from a remote South Pole research station. After making a stop for a few hours at a British station on the edge of Antarctica, the two workers were flown to the southernmost Chilean city of Punta Arenas. In a chaotic two days of flying, the rescue team flew 3,000 miles round trip from the British station Rothera to pick up the workers at the U.S. Amundsen Scott Station at the South Pole. The two patients aboard will be transported to a medical facility that can provide a level of care that is not available at Amundsen Scott, says a spokesperson. Normally, planes don't go to the polar post from February to October because of the dangers of flying in the pitch dark and cold. Antarctica creates a hostile environment, says the operations director for the British Antarctic Survey. If you are not careful, it'll come round and bite you. Questions 3 and 4 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 3. What was the small plane's mission to Antarctica? Question 4. What makes flying to Antarctica dangerous from February to October? News Report 3. A pilot from Virginia removed his son's loose tooth using a helicopter. Rick Rahim, from Virginia, flies helicopters for a living, and when his seven-year-old son's tooth became loose, he did not waste time by tying it to a door handle. Instead, Mr. Rahim tied one end of a string around his son's tooth and the other end to his full-sized commercial helicopter. The father of four posted a video clip of his playful venture on Facebook advising parents to do fun and creative stuff with their kids. The video shows him launching the helicopter into the air and flying just far enough to successfully remove the loose tooth. At the end of the video, Mr. Rahim assures watchers that the circumstances were safe and that he has 13 years of helicopter flying experience behind him. You've got to do everything safe in life, and that's what I did today, he said. Mr. Rahim later said that although some parents have used remote control helicopters to pull teeth before, he might be the first to use a full-sized aircraft, as he can't find evidence that it has been done before. Questions 5 to 7 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 5. How did Rick Rahim remove his son's loose tooth?
Question 6. What does the news report say about Rick Rahim? Question 7. What did Rick Rahim advise parents to do with their kids? Section B. Directions. In this section, you will hear two long conversations. At the end of each conversation, you will hear four questions. Both the conversation and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the center. Conversation 1 Hi, Emma speaking. Who's this? Hi, Emma. I'm Paul from Hermes Delivery Service. Here's a package for you. Are you at home to collect it? Oh, sorry, Paul. I'm out at the moment. Can you put it in my mailbox? I'm afraid I can't do that. Sorry. The package is too big, and it needs a signature to confirm you have received it. So I would need to deliver it at a time when you're in. OK. Well, I'm out all day today but I should be in tomorrow morning before I go out for lunch, and then I'll be at home again later in the afternoon. Will either of those times be convenient for you? They're not, unfortunately. I'm sorry. I won't be in the area tomorrow, as I have some other deliveries to make on the other side of town. I could come the day after, if that suits you. OK, yes, that should be fine. I have a friend coming round in the afternoon, but I'll be at home, so the day after tomorrow will be great. Do I need to pay for the package? No, you don't. It says here that you paid for it when you ordered it online. Oh, yes, I did. I got mixed up. So you just need to sign the form to say you've received it. OK, great. See you the day after tomorrow, then. Yes, see you then. Questions 8 to 11 are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question 8. Why is the man making the phone call? Question 9. Why can't the woman meet the man today? Question 10. Why is the man unable to see the woman tomorrow? Question 11. What should the woman do to receive her purchase? Conversation 2 Hi, Emily. I hear you're leaving for Italy soon. Do you plan to have a going-away party before you disappear? It'd be really nice for us to hang out together before you go. I'm not sure. I'm leaving in just two more days, and I'm going to miss all my friends here, and especially this place. Why don't you come over? I'm feeling rather sad, actually. I'm currently sitting alone at a table outside the Black Cat Cafe, listening to the rain and watching people passing by. I'm sorry. I can't just now. I need to get this assignment finished by Monday, and I'm way behind. Anyhow, cheer up. You're not leaving for good, and you'll absolutely love Italy. Yeah, you're right. But I just feel like I'm not quite ready to go. 
and studying in a foreign country seems a bit overwhelming. Just think of your life in Milan. In the mornings, you can go down to a small local cafe, soaking up the sun's rays and drinking coffee. I envy you. You can buy lots of gorgeous Italian clothes. That does sound nice, and of course I can keep in touch with everyone through Facebook. Maybe you can all come visit me. Of course we will. When is your flight? On Saturday after lunch at one forty-five. Okay, I'll try and come to the airport on Saturday to see you off. I'll give you a call that morning, no matter what. Questions twelve to fifteen are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question twelve: What is the woman going to do? Question thirteen: How does the woman feel at the moment? Question fourteen: Why can't the man meet the woman now? Question fifteen: What will the man possibly do on Saturday? Section C, directions. In this section, you will hear three passages. At the end of each passage, you will hear three or four questions. Both the passage and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter. On answer sheet one, with a single line through the center. Passage one. Mount Etna is one of the most active volcanoes on Earth. The mountain has been in a state of near continuous eruption for half a million years. Exploring the Etna geographical area reveals a history written in fire. Before the eruptions, it was covered by forests of pine trees. Located in southern Italy, Etna is the highest active volcano in Europe. However, its height often changes when volcanic material accumulates during eruptions and subsequently collapses. Few volcanoes in the world have an eruption history so thoroughly documented by historical records. Etna's eruption history dates back as far as 1,500 B.C. Some two hundred eruptions have been recorded down through the centuries, but compared with other volcanoes, most of its eruptions have so far been fairly light in terms of death and destruction. Only about one hundred deaths have been attributed to the volcano. The mountain hasn't been entirely harmless, however. In 1928, it destroyed the town of Mascali. Over the centuries, Etna's lower slopes have been shaped by human hands to take advantage of rich soils for growing grapes, apples, and nuts. Local people have also carved out over two hundred caves in the soft rock and used them for everything from sacred burial places to food storage. Large mammals once wandered the volcano slopes, but today. Foxes, wild cats, rabbits, and mice are more common. Some of those small mammals help to sustain such big birds as golden eagles. Questions sixteen to eighteen are based on the passage you have just heard. Question sixteen: What does the speaker say about Mount Etna?
Question 17. What do we learn about the lower slopes of Mount Etna? Question 18. What does the speaker say about big birds like golden eagles at Mount Etna? Passage 2. My name is Brendan Leonard, and I'm an author, magazine writer, filmmaker, and public speaker. I'm self-employed, which means I work for myself and I do what I love. We have a popular saying in America which goes, do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life. But I'm here to tell you that instead of focusing on doing what we love, I think we should focus on loving what we do. In my line of work, you hear a lot about talent, which is an idea we've mostly invented to give ourselves an excuse to be lazy. Here's why. If you see someone doing something really well, you would say it's because they're talented. You think they're somehow special. You discount the tremendous amount of work they've done to get to where they are. Research has shown that talent is nothing without hard work. I choose to believe in hard work, but not so much in talent. There are no special people, just people who put in enough hard work until something special happens. I can promise you one thing. Whatever you choose to do for a career, if you work hard at it, eventually special things will happen. They may not happen as quickly as you'd like them to, and they may turn out to be completely different from the special things you imagined at the beginning, but they will happen. Questions 19 to 21 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 19. What do we learn about the speaker? Question 20. What is the speaker's advice to his audience? Question 21. What does the speaker say about talent? Passage 3. A question we often ask others, and are also frequently asked by others, is, what do you normally do after school or work? Some commonplace answers are, well, I go to the gym. Um, I just go home and watch TV. I meet my friends for dinner. Or, I just go to bed because it's so late and I'm tired. Unlike any of these typical responses, I'm proud to say that I love to dance salsa after a long and tiring day of work. Salsa is a kind of dancing that evolved in the mid-1970s in New York. My dancing life began not because I wanted to do it, but because my mother was sick and tired of seeing me running around after school doing nothing. So she enrolled me into a ballet course when I was six. I fell in love with it instantly and continued with ballet dancing for about ten years. Then I left my native country of New Zealand to start my career as an English teacher, which eventually brought my dancing life to a halt. It wasn't until I rediscovered salsa in a lovely studio while working in Asia that I renewed my passion for dancing. Since then, 
I have been trying to attend dancing classes twice a week after work. It's a great way for me to relieve stress and pressure, and dance my way towards feeling energetic and happy again. Questions 22 to 25 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 22. What does the speaker say about the dance salsa? Question 23. Why did the speaker's mother enroll her in a ballet course? Question 24. When did the speaker's dancing life come to a halt? Question 25. In what way has salsa dancing benefited the speaker? This is the end of listening comprehension. College English Test Band 4, Part 2, Listening Comprehension. Section A. Directions. In this section, you will hear three news reports. At the end of each news report, you will hear two or three questions. Both the news report and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the centre. News Report 1. New York City Police captured a cow on the loose in Prospect Park on Tuesday after the animal became an attraction for tourists while walking along the streets and enjoying the park facilities. The confused creature and camera-holding humans stared at each other through a fence for several minutes. At other times, the cow wandered around the 526-acre park and the artificial grass field normally used for human sporting events. Officers use soccer goals to fence the animal in. However, the cow then moved through one of the nets, knocking down a police officer in the process. Police eventually trapped the cow between two vehicles parked on either side of a baseball field's bench area. An officer then shot an arrow to put it to sleep. Then officers waited for the drug to take effect. After it fell asleep, they loaded the cow into a horse trailer. It was not clear where the cow came from or how it got lost. Police turned it over to the Animal Control Department after they caught it. Questions 1 and 2 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 1. What happened in New York's Prospect Park on Tuesday? Question 2. What do we learn about the cow from the end of the news report? News Report 2 Starting April 28th of this year, the National Museum of Natural History will begin renovating its Fossil Hall. The Fossil Hall, which displays some of the world's oldest and largest fossil specimens, receives more than 2 million visitors each year. It's one of the museum's most famous attractions. As a result, the museum plans to expand the hall as well as add to its ancient bird collection. Bird lovers, both young and old, 
have already responded with excitement at the news. The museum's social media account has been flooded with messages of support. In the meantime, the current collection will be closed. However, visitors will be compensated during the closure. The museum's special exhibition area will now be free of charge. This week, the resident exhibition is a display of ancient wall paintings on loan from Australia. They celebrate the cultural heritage of the country and will be available to view until Sunday. Next week, the exhibition will be taken over by the Wildlife Photographer of the Year competition. The winner of this year's competition will be awarded a preview of the new fossil hall as well as a cash prize. Questions three and four are based on the news report you have just heard. Question three: What does the news report say about the fossil hall of the National Museum of Natural History? Question four. What is on display this week in the museum's resident exhibition hall? News Report 3. Six birds have just been trained to pick up rubbish at a French historical theme park. According to the park's manager, Mr. Villiers, the goal is not just to clear up the park. He says visitors are already good at keeping things clean. Instead, he wants to show that nature itself can teach us to take care of the environment. He says that rooks, the chosen birds, are considered to be particularly intelligent. In the right circumstances, they even like to communicate with humans and establish a relationship through play. The birds will be encouraged to clean the park through the use of a small box that delivers a small amount of bird food each time the rook deposits a cigarette end or a small piece of rubbish. So far, visitors to the theme park have been excited to see the birds in action. However, some parents are concerned that it encourages their children to drop litter so they can watch the birds pick it up. Villiers is not concerned about this criticism. He maintains most of the feedback he has received has been overwhelmingly positive. He hopes now to train more birds. Questions five to seven are based on the news report you have just heard. Question five: What have six birds been trained to do at a French historical theme park? Question six: Why were rooks chosen by the park manager? Question seven: What is the concern of some parents? Section B, directions. In this section, you'll hear two long conversations. At the end of each conversation, you'll hear four questions. Both the conversation and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet one. With a single line through the center. Conversation one. The name of the TV show we wish to produce is Science Nation. Please tell us more. What will Science Nation be about? It'll be about science, all sorts of science. Each episode will focus on a different area of science. 
and tell us what we know, how we know it, and what we still don't know. The show will have one host only, and this will be Professor Susan Powell from Harvard University. She's a great public speaker. So, just to be clear, will the show's format be like that of a documentary? Kind of. It'll be like a documentary in the sense that it'll be nonfiction and fact-based. However, our idea is for it to be also fun and entertaining, something which traditional documentaries aren't so much. Please keep in mind this will be a new TV show like nothing ever done before. Okay, so it'll be both educational and entertaining, and your audience will be anyone interested in science, right? That's correct. Yes. Right. Thank you. So I think we're more or less clear on what the show will be like. Could you please tell us now what exactly you want from us? Yes, of course. Basically, what we need from you is financial support. In order to go ahead with this idea, we need two million dollars. This would cover the cost of making all twelve shows in the first season for the first year. If the show is a success, we can then look at making a second season for the following year. Questions eight to eleven are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question eight. What do we learn about the TV show Science Nation? Question nine: In what way will the TV show Science Nation differ from traditional documentaries? Question ten: Who will be the intended audience of the TV show Science Nation? Question eleven: What does the woman want the man to do for the TV show? Conversation two. What's up with you? You don't look very happy. I feel like I'm a failure. I can't seem to do anything very well. I wouldn't say that. You do very well in a lot of things. That presentation you gave last week was excellent. Yes, but I have this urge to strive for perfection. I really want to push harder and progress further. Well, that's very admirable, but be careful. Overconcern with being perfect can damage our confidence if we never achieve it. Yes, I know. I feel awful whenever I make a mistake in whatever I'm trying to do. Well, think about it. You can't make progress without making mistakes and learning from them. Thomas Edison, the famous inventor, once said. I've not failed. I've just found ten thousand ways that won't work. You may well be right. I guess I should recognize my mistakes and learn the lesson they teach me and move forward. Also, remember, a successful ending is not the only thing worthy of a celebration. You need to recognize each step of progress you take towards achieving your goals, and no matter how tiny it is, it's still good news. I always feel down when I see others accomplishing things, and I feel miserable about my own achievements. I'm always trying to be as good as others, but I never seem to get there. Listen, if you always compare yourself with others, you'll never feel good enough. You're the only person you should be comparing yourself with. When you compare your current status with the starting point, you'll find you've made progress, right? That's good enough. 
That's great advice. Thank you. I'm feeling better already. Questions twelve to fifteen are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question twelve: How does a man feel about himself? Question thirteen: What does the woman think is the man's problem? Question fourteen: How does the man feel when he sees others accomplishing things? Question fifteen: What does the woman suggest the man do? Section C, directions. In this section, you will hear three passages. At the end of each passage, you will hear three or four questions. Both the passage and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet one. With a single line through the center. Passage one. Single-sex education can have enormous benefits for female students. Numerous studies have shown that women who attend single-sex schools tend to have stronger self-confidence, better study habits, and more ambitious career goals than women who attend co-educational schools. Girls who graduate from single-sex schools. Are three times more likely to become engineers than those who attend co-educational schools. The reason is that all girls' schools encourage women to enter fields traditionally dominated by men, such as science, technology, and engineering. In co-educational schools, girls are often expected to succeed only in the humanities or the arts. Research has also shown that in co-educational settings. Teachers are more likely to praise and give in-depth responses to a boy's comments in class. In contrast, they might only respond to a girl's comments with a nod. They are also more likely to encourage boys to work through problems on their own, while they tend to step in and help girls who struggle with a problem. In an all-girls setting, girls are more likely to speak up frequently. And make significant contributions to class than in a co-educational setting. Girls studying in a single-sex setting also earn higher scores on their college board and advanced placement exams than girls who study in co-educational settings. All girls' schools tend to be smaller than co-educational schools, which means teachers will be able to tailor the materials to girls' students' personal learning styles and interests. Questions sixteen to eighteen are based on the passage you have just heard. Question sixteen: What advantage does the speaker say girls from single-sex schools have over those from co-educational schools? Question seventeen. What do teachers tend to do in co-educational settings? Question eighteen: What are teachers more likely to do in an all-girls school? Passage two: 
Today, I found out that Seattle doesn't really get that much rain compared with most U.S. cities. In fact, Seattle ranks 44th among major U.S. cities in average annual rainfall. Cities that get more rainfall than Seattle include Houston, Memphis, Nashville, and pretty much every major city on the eastern coast, such as New York, Boston, and Miami. So why does everyone think of Seattle as a rainy city? The primary root of this misconception lies in that Seattle has a relatively large number of days per year with rainfall. Compared with New York and Boston, which get an average of about 16 percent more rain per year than Seattle, but also average between them about 36 fewer days a year of rainfall, so it rains a lot less in Seattle, and the rain is spread out over more days than those cities. This is why few locals in Seattle carry an umbrella generally. When it does rain, it tends to be a very light rain that isn't troublesome. It almost never really rains, as most people think. On top of that, it never really storms in Seattle either. Seattle gets an average of a mere seven days a year with thunder. So, in short, if you like sunny but not too hot summers, mild winters but with lots of cloudy days, Seattle's the place to be. Anyway, if you visit Seattle, don't bring an umbrella. People will look at you, thinking you're funny. Questions nineteen to twenty-one are based on the passage you have just heard. Question nineteen: What did the speaker find out about Seattle? Question twenty: Why do local people in Seattle seldom carry an umbrella? Question twenty-one: Why does the speaker say Seattle is a good place to be? Passage three. After a tough workout or a day full of physical activity, it's common to find your muscles aching. But where do these pains come from? According to a German professor, the soreness comes from straining your muscles in an uncommon way. For example, jumping on a bicycle for a ride. Because you haven't ridden in a long time, soreness occurs since your leg muscles. Aren't used to that movement. When muscles perform an activity they aren't regularly exposed to, the tiny fibers that are inside them are being torn apart. As muscle soreness develops, the body has to work to repair the muscle tears. But this doesn't happen immediately. First, the body must realize the muscles are damaged. When the body realizes the muscles are hurt. The response is to increase blood flow to the area and increase body heat. Damaged cells are then cleaned up, and the body sends cells specially designed to break down the large muscle fiber fragments. Healing can take place after this. It takes about a day until these cells make it to your aching muscles. That's why there's most often a delay associated with muscle soreness. Repair of damaged cells takes about two days, and afterwards the soreness disappears. Unfortunately, there's little that can be done to relieve muscle soreness. Pain relieving creams don't work, but a hot shower or warm bath can provide some relief. Questions twenty-two to twenty-five are based on the passage you have just heard. Question twenty-two. What does the German professor say about muscle soreness?
Question twenty three: What happens when muscles are damaged? According to the passage. Question twenty four: How long does it take for damaged cells to heal? Question twenty five: What does the speaker suggest one do to relieve muscle soreness? This is the end of listening comprehension. 听力考试结束，请考生暂停作答。College English Test Band Four, Part Two, Listening Comprehension, Section A, Directions. In this section, you will hear three news reports. At the end of each news report, you will hear two or three questions. Both the news report and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet one with a single line through the centre. News report one: The British government has called for more men to consider a career in nursing. Figures show the number of male nurses has fallen in the last three years. Now the number of men working in the nursing sector has reached a seven-year low. Numbers of male nurses increased between 2011 and 2014, and reached a peak of 7,168. This figure has dropped to only 6,924 in 2017. The UK Health Secretary said, "This is clearly a cultural problem." And probably one that exists in many parts of the world, but we can make efforts to change that now. We want to persuade males to think about career options of going into nursing. There is absolutely no reason why men can't go into this profession. The health secretary said that the government already has plans to attract a more varied workforce into nursing. She stated. We are leading the way on workforce planning. We will become the first nation in Europe to publish a national health and care workforce plan. Questions one and two are based on the news report you have just heard. Question one: What problem is Britain facing? Question two: What is the cause of the problem, according to the UK Health Secretary? News report two: A man from Libya was enjoying a walk along the sands at Southport Beach. When he was about half a mile out from the dock, he felt a bit tired, so he lay down and fell asleep. But the tide swept in quickly at the beach, and the man was shocked to wake up and find the tide had come in and completely surrounded him, cutting him off from the shore. Fortunately for him, the beach lifeguards were quickly on the scene to stop him from drowning. They acted professionally to ensure the man was comfortable. Until an ambulance arrived, he was then taken to hospital. He is now in a stable condition. When interviewed, Keith Porter of the Southport Beach said, "Our beach is so flat that it's very common for the tide to come around the back of people and cut them off from the beach. Thankfully, the emergency services have again worked well together to ensure a positive outcome, and we wish the gentleman a speedy recovery." Questions three and four are based on the news report you have just heard.
Question 3. What does the news report say about the Libyan man? Question 4. What did Keith Porter say at an interview? News Report 3. A raccoon, a small cat-like animal, climbed to the top of a 25-story skyscraper early on Wednesday. It was captured after becoming an online star across the world. At a little before 3 a.m., the animal made it to the roof of the building after it took a long break on a 17th floor window edge. At the top of the building, animal control officers put cat food in traps and captured the raccoon. A private wildlife management company will release the animal into the wild. The raccoon's upward journey began on Monday. The brown animal was spotted stuck on a narrow window edge of the office tower. On Tuesday, the raccoon slowly climbed the building. It reached the 23rd floor and its legend continued to grow on social media with every floor it climbed. As it went up, people gathered on the sidewalk below to take photos and cheer for its safety. Online, office workers posted photos and videos of the raccoon resting on window edges and climbing up the building's concrete exterior. One online post said that the raccoon has succeeded in uniting the country the way no politician could. Questions 5 to 7 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 5. What does the news report say about the raccoon, a small cat-like animal? Question 6. What will the wildlife management company do with the captured raccoon? Question 7. What did one online post say? Section B. Directions. In this section you'll hear two long conversations. At the end of each conversation you'll hear four questions. Both the conversation and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the center. Conversation 1 I have really amazing news. I just got a text message from my bank saying my salary has been deposited in my account. Getting paid is good, but I don't understand why you're so excited. It happens every month. Well, I've been working for a few years. In fact, I worked all through university, but I only had part-time jobs then. So this is the first time I've ever been paid for a month of full-time work. Wow, then you must feel great. I mean, it's been two decades, but I can still remember when I got my first real salary. I was happy for days, and I felt like it was a small fortune, even though it wasn't. Yeah, I've never earned so much money before, and there's so many things I'd like to do with it. What did you do with your first pay? I bought a new suit for work and took my parents to a nice restaurant to celebrate. Maybe you could do the same. I have enough professional clothes, and my parents are across the country, so seeing them is impossible. 
but some people from the office are members of a gym I want to join, and my university classmates are arranging a trip to visit our old campus, and I'd love to go with them, but I can't afford both. If I were you, I'd join the gym because it's a good way to stay healthy, and it might help you build a stronger relationship with your colleagues. And good relationships are key to a successful career. Hmm, you're right. Thanks for the advice. I'm taking it. Questions eight to eleven are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question eight: Why did the woman feel excited? Question nine: When did the man get his first full-time job? Question ten: What did the man do when he got his first pay? Question eleven: What does the woman say she is going to do? Conversation two: What's going on with you lately? You seem so distracted, like you aren't really listening to anything I say. I know. I'm sorry. I can't seem to focus on anything because I still haven't decided if I should accept the offer for that PhD program in London, or if I should take the job offer in New York. Look, it's a tough decision, but you're running out of time, aren't you? I thought you said the company expected an answer by the end of the month. Actually, it's the beginning of next month for the job. But the university needs a decision by the end of the week, so I have to act quickly. You definitely need advice for an important decision like this. So, who have you talked to about it? What does your family think? And your advisor for your master's program? I've asked their advice, and that's part of the problem. My parents want me to get the degree, but my advisor thinks it's time for me to get more work experience. What do you mean by part of the problem? Oh wait, it's your girlfriend, isn't it? You've been dating since your first year of university, so that's six years now. She must have an opinion about all this. I mean, isn't it time for you to think about getting married? Well, I do want to get married, but she thinks we need to wait until we've launched our careers. Plus, she's not sure what she'll be doing next year. She's considering a job in England and one in Australia, and her parents are pushing for the latter. Questions twelve to fifteen are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question twelve: Why does the man seem to be distracted? Question thirteen: What does the woman say the man should do? Question fourteen: What does the man say is part of his problem? Question fifteen: Why doesn't the man's girlfriend agree to get married right now?
Section C, Directions. In this section, you will hear three passages. At the end of each passage, you will hear three or four questions. Both the passage and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the center. Passage 1 Analytical skills are our ability to understand and solve problems using the information we have available. These skills are extremely important for our professional, social, and intellectual lives. What are the best ways to improve them? One way is to expand your world view. Unfortunately, this takes time. Ultimately, it will help you better evaluate information and analyze different ideas and outcomes. Traveling is a great way to expand your world view, although it can be expensive. An entertaining way of enhancing your analytical skills is to engage them by playing brain games. These are games that challenge you to think deeply and to develop your analytical skills. These games will get you used to thinking in a certain way. As a result, they will help improve your ability to think. However, opinions vary on whether video games are effective. The general consensus is that the best ones avoid mindless violence and instead focus on strategy and challenge us to solve problems and achieve broad goals. Joining a debate or reading club or group is also a good idea. This provides people with the opportunity to come together and discuss ideas, literature and problems. Groups like these will help you refine your analytical skills and enable you to express yourself better. Any social group that encourages free exchange of ideas and pursuit of knowledge is beneficial. It helps you to actively develop your analytical skills. Questions 16 to 18 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 16. What kind of ability do analytical skills refer to in the passage? Question 17. What does the passage say is an entertaining way of enhancing one's analytical skills? Question 18. What else does the speaker advise people to do to improve their analytical skills? Passage 2. There's an endless amount of scientific data proving that dogs can develop strong bonds with their owners. People aren't kidding when they say they love their dog, or their dog loves them. But we're rather ignorant about the nature of the relationships that form between dogs. In an effort to understand the matter further, I spoke with Dr. Mark Beckoff, a researcher and former professor of animal behavior. The doctor's response to the question of whether or not dogs can fall in love like humans do was a straight, of course. He went on to say that if love is defined as a long-term commitment, meaning dogs seek one another out when they're apart, they're happy when they're reunited, they protect one another, they feed one another, they raise their children together, then, of course, dogs love each other. Now, our furry friends don't really experience romantic love like in the movies, 
but they can form deep and lasting bonds with their fellow dogs as well as humans. In fact, evidence shows that most dogs stay with one partner their whole lives. In actuality, love between dogs can be even more intimate than human relationships. When they interact, they aren't afraid to smell each other and will express themselves clearly and honestly. Once again, it seems we have a lot to learn from dogs. Questions 19 to 21 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 19. What does the passage say we don't know much about? Question 20. What does Dr. Mark Beckoff say about dogs? Question 21. What does the speaker say about most dogs? Passage 3. A piece of history has been found thanks to a boy tripping on a rare 1.2 million year old animal fossil. In November 2016, Jude Sparks, now 10, was on an outing with his family near their New Mexico home when he tripped over what he thought was a cow bone. Now, researchers at New Mexico State University are preserving the discovery, which was identified as an ancient elephant-like animal. Kyle Sparks, father of Jude, said he let his son decide what to do with the fossil. So Jude reached out to Peter Hode, a professor at New Mexico State University, who had experience with the same type of fossil in the past. The next day, Hode came out to see the fossil for himself. Hode told ABC News that he was quite excited about the find. It was fortunate that the family didn't try to dig up the fossil because that could destroy the specimen. They did the right thing by calling someone who would know what to do. It's great for the community because now everybody can appreciate it, he added. Hode and his fellow faculty members dug up the fossil in late May. They hoped to return to the site with geologists for an additional search as there could be more fossils near the site. Jude and his family had been invited by the researchers to see the fossil being preserved at the university. Questions 22 to 25 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 22. What did the boy Jude Sparks think he had discovered? Question 23. What are the researchers at New Mexico State University doing with the boy's discovery? Question 24. What did Professor Peter Hode say when interviewed by ABC News? Question 25. What do the researchers plan to do? This is the end of listening comprehension. 听力考试结束,请考生暂停作答. College English Test Band 4 Part 2, Listening Comprehension Section A, 
Directions. In this section, you will hear three news reports. At the end of each news report, you will hear two or three questions. Both the news report and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet one with a single line through the center. News report one: A message in a bottle sent out to sea by a New Hampshire man more than five decades ago was found one thousand five hundred miles away, and has been returned to his daughter. The long lost message was discovered by Clint Buffington of Utah while he was vacationing. Buffington says he found a soda bottle half buried in the sand that looked like it had been there since the beginning of time. The note inside the bottle said, "Return to four one nine Ocean Street and receive a reward of a hundred and fifty dollars from Richard and Tina Pierce, owners of the Beachcomber Motel." The motel was owned by the parents of Paula Pierce in 1960. Her father had written the note as a joke, and had thrown it into the Atlantic Ocean. Buffington flew to New Hampshire to deliver the message to Paula Pierce. She held up to her father's promise, giving Buffington that reward. But the biggest reward is the message in a bottle finding its way back home. Questions one and two are based on the news report you have just heard. Question one. What is the news report mainly about? Question two: Why did Paula Pierce? Give Clint Buffington the reward. News report two: Millions of bees have died in South Carolina during aerial insect spraying operations that were carried out to combat the Zika virus. The insect spraying over the weekend left more than two million bees dead on the spot in Dorchester County, South Carolina, where four travel-related cases of Zika disease have been confirmed in the area. Most of the deaths came from Flower Town Bee Farm, a company in Somerville that sells bees and honey products. Juanita Stanley, who owns the company, said the farm looks like it's been destroyed. The farm lost about 2.5 million bees. Dorchester County officials apologized for the accidental mass killing of bees. Dorchester County is aware that some beekeepers in the area that was sprayed on Sunday lost their bee colonies. County Manager Jason Ward said in a statement, "I'm not pleased that so many bees were killed." Questions three and four are based on the news report you have just heard. Question three: Why were spraying operations carried out in Dorchester County? Question four. What does the news report say about Flower Town Bee Farm? News report three: The world's largest aircraft has taken to the skies for the first time. The Airlander 10 spent nearly two hours in the air, having taken off from Cardington Airfield in Bedfordshire. During its flight, it reached 3,000 feet and performed a series of gentle turns all over a safe area. 
The aircraft is massive, as long as a football field and as tall as six double-decker buses and capable of flying for up to five days. It was first developed for the U.S. government as a long-range spy aircraft, but was abandoned following budget cutbacks. The aircraft cost £25 million and can carry heavier loads than huge jet planes, while also producing less noise and emitting less pollution. The makers believe it's the future of aircraft, and one day we'll be using them to go places. But there's still a long way to go. The airlander will need to have 200 hours flying time before being allowed to fly by the Aviation Administration. If it passes, though, we can hope we'll all get some extra leg room. Questions 5 to 7 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 5. What do we learn about the first flight of the Airlander 10? Question 6. What caused the U.S. government to abandon the Airlander 10 as a spy aircraft? Question 7. What is the advantage of the Airlander 10 over huge jet planes? Section B. Directions. In this section, you will hear two long conversations. At the end of each conversation, you will hear four questions. Both the conversation and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C and D. Then, Mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the centre. Conversation 1 Do you feel like going out tonight? Yeah, why not? We haven't been out for ages. What's on? Well, there's a film about climate change. Does it sound good to you? Oh, not really. It doesn't really appeal to me. What's it about? Just climate change? I think it's about how climate change affects everyday life. I wonder how they make it entertaining. Well, it sounds really awful. It's an important subject, I agree, but I'm not in the mood for anything depressing. What else is on? There's a Spanish dance festival. Oh, I love dance. That sounds really interesting. Apparently, it's absolutely brilliant. Let's see what it says in the paper. Anna Gomez leads in an exciting production of the great Spanish love story, Carmen. OK, then. What time is it on? At 7.30. Well, that's no good. We haven't got enough time to get there. Is there anything else? There's a comedy special on. Where's it on? It's at the City Theatre. It's a charity comedy night with lots of different acts. It looks pretty good. The critic in the local paper says it's the funniest thing he's ever seen. It says here, Roger Whitehead is an amazing host to a night of fun performances. Hmm, I'm not keen on him. He's not very funny. Are you sure you fancy going out tonight? You're not very enthusiastic. Perhaps you're right. OK, let's go see the dance, but tomorrow, not tonight. Great. I'll book the tickets online. Questions 8 to 11 are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question 8. What does the woman think of climate change? Question 9. Why do the speakers give up going to the Spanish Dance Festival tonight?
Question 10. What does the critic say about the comedy performed at the City Theatre? Question 11. What does the woman decide to do tomorrow? Conversation 2. Good morning, Mr. Lee. May I have a minute of your time? Sure, Catherine. What can I do for you? I'm quite anxious about transferring over to your college. I'm afraid I won't fit in. Don't worry, Catherine. It's completely normal for you to be nervous about transferring schools. This happens to many transfer students. Yes, I know, but I'm younger than most of the students in my year, and that worries me a lot. Well, you may be the only younger one in your year, but, you know, we have a lot of after-school activities you can join in, and so, this way, you'll be able to meet new friends of different age groups. That's nice. I love games and hobby groups. I'm sure you do, so you'll be just fine. Don't worry so much and try to make the most of what we have on offer here. Also, remember that you can come to me any time of the day if you need help. Thanks so much. I definitely feel better now. As a matter of fact, I've already contacted one of the girls who'd be living in the same house as me, and she seemed really nice. I guess, living on campus, I'll have a chance to have a closer circle of friends, since we'll be living together. All students are very friendly with new arrivals. Let me check who'd be living with you in your flat. OK, there are Hannah, Kelly, and Bree. Bree is also a new student here, like you. I'm sure you two will have more to share with each other. Questions 12 to 15 are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question 12. Why does Catherine feel anxious? Question 13. What does Mr. Lee encourage Catherine to do? Question 14. What does Mr. Lee promise to do for Catherine? Question 15. What do we learn about Catherine's schoolmate, Bree? Section C. Directions. In this section, you will hear three passages. At the end of each passage, you will hear three or four questions. Both the passage and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C and D. Then, mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the centre. Passage 1. Have you ever felt like you would do just about anything to satisfy your hunger? A new study in mice may help to explain why hunger can feel like such a powerful motivating force. In the study, researchers found that hunger outweighed other physical drives including fear, thirst, and social needs. To determine which feeling won out, the researchers did a series of experiments. In one experiment, the mice were both hungry and thirsty. When given the choice of either eating food or drinking water, 
the mice went for the food the researchers found. However, when the mice were well fed but thirsty, they opted to drink, according to the study. In the second experiment meant to pit the mice's hunger against their fear, hungry mice were placed in a cage that had certain fox scented areas and other places that smelled safer. In other words, not like an animal that could eat them, but also had food. It turned out that when the mice were hungry, they ventured into the unsafe areas for food, but when the mice were well fed, they stayed in areas of the cage that were considered safe. Hunger also outweighed the mice's social needs, the researchers found. Mice are usually social animals and prefer to be in the company of other mice, according to the study. When the mice were hungry, they opted to leave the company of other mice to go get food. Questions 16 to 18 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 16. What is the researcher's purpose in carrying out the series of experiments with mice? Question 17. In what circumstances do mice venture into unsafe areas? Question 18. What is said about mice at the end of the passage? Passage 2. The United States has one of the best highway systems in the world. Interstate highways connect just about every large and mid-sized city in the country. Did you ever wonder why such a complete system of excellent roads exists? For an answer, you would have to go back to the early 1920s. In those years, just after World War I, the military wanted to build an American highway system for national defence. Such a system could if necessary, move troops quickly from one area to another. It could also get people out of cities in danger of being bombed. So-called roads of national importance were designated, but they were mostly small country roads. In 1944, Congress passed a bill to upgrade the system, but did not fund the plan right away. In the 1950s, the plan began to become a reality. Over $25 billion was appropriated by Congress, and construction began on about 40,000 miles of new roads. The idea was to connect the new system to existing expressways and freeways. And, though the system was built mostly to make car travel easier, defence was not forgotten. For instance... Highway overpasses had to be high enough to allow trailers carrying military missiles to pass under them. By 1974, the system was mostly completed. A few additional roads would come later. Quick and easy travel between all parts of the country was now possible. Questions 19 to 21 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 19. What does the speaker say about the American highway system? Question 20. What was the original purpose of building a highway system?
Question 21. When was the interstate highway system mostly completed? Passage 3. Texting while driving was listed as a major cause of road deaths among young Americans back in 2013. A recent study said that 40% of American teens claimed to have been in a car when the driver used a cell phone in a way that put people in danger. This sounds like a widespread disease, but it's one that technology may now help to cure. T.J. Everts, a 20-year-old inventor, has come up with a novel solution that could easily put texting drivers on notice. It's called Smart Wheel, and it's designed to fit over the steering wheel of most standard vehicles to track whether or not the driver has two hands on the wheel at all times. Everts' invention warns the drivers with a light and a sound when they hold the wheel with one hand only, but as soon as they place the other hand back on the wheel, the light turns back to green and the sound stops. It also watches for what's called close-by hands, where both hands are close together near the top of the wheel so the driver can type with both thumbs and drive at the same time. All the data Smart Wheel collects is also sent to a connected app, so any parents who install Smart Wheel can keep track of the teen's driving habits. If they try to remove or damage the cover, that's reported as well. Questions 22 to 25 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 22. What is a major cause of road deaths among young Americans? Question 23. What is Smart Wheel? Question 24. What happens if the driver has one hand on the wheel? Question 25. How do parents keep track of their teen's driving habits? This is the end of listening comprehension. College English Test Band 4 Part 2. Listening Comprehension Section A. Directions In this section, you will hear three news reports. At the end of each news report, you will hear two or three questions. Both the news report and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1, with a single line through the center. News Report 1 Kelly Swisher, an Arkansas woman, escaped injury and managed to safely stop her car after a four-foot-long rat snake came out from under her car seat and slid across her feet as she was driving down the highway. Rat snakes aren't poisonous or a threat to people generally, but the woman says the snake she encountered Thursday terrified her out of her wits. It was rough, with big scales, said Swisher, who was on her way to pick up her friend at the airport when it happened. I don't know whether I had my hands on the steering wheel or not. I am not the most flexible person in the world.
but I can guarantee my knees were up next to my ears. She said the snake first slid back under the seat, and she hoped it would stay there until she was able to get off the highway and stop. That didn't work out, she said. Here he comes, and he wound up in my back seat before I could finally get off the road, stop, and get out of the car. She called for help, and Washington County Animal Control Officers came and captured the snake. Questions 1 and 2 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 1. How did Kelly Swisher feel when she first came across the rat snake? Question 2. What does the report say about the snake? News Report 2. Fast food, it turns out, isn't quite as fast as it used to be. A new study finds that McDonald's posted its slowest drive through times since this survey was first conducted 15 years ago. At McDonald's, customers will spend on average 3 minutes and 9 seconds from the time they place their orders until they receive their food. That's about 10 seconds more than the industry average, and a lot slower than a decade ago, according to the study which was commissioned by QSR, an industry trade publication. And McDonald's wasn't alone in slowing down. Other chains also saw their drive through performance slow down. Among the reasons for the slower service, today there are more choices on the menu, and the products themselves are more complex and take longer to prepare. Speed, of course, is essential to the drive through experience, and drive throughs are hugely important to chains such as McDonald's, Burger King, and Taco Bell. Usually, the drive through accounts for 60 to 70 percent of all business that goes through a fast food restaurant, notes Sam Oches, editor of QSR. Of course, consumers also want their orders prepared correctly, and on that score, Oches says, Accuracy is still really high. Questions 3 and 4 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 3. What is the news report mainly about? Question 4. What has slowed down McDonald's drive through service? News Report 3 The first private mission outside of Earth's orbit is closer than many of us think. U.S. government officials are set to approve a mission by privately held space company Moon Express to travel outside of Earth's orbit in late 2017. Moon Express's mission involves plans to land a suitcase-sized package of scientific equipment on the Moon for ongoing exploration and commercial development. The decision involved months of lobbying and coordinated conversations between a number of federal agencies. Under international treaties, the U.S. is responsible for the cargo of both public and private spacecraft. This makes commercial space travel a complex legal issue, not just domestically, but abroad. A Moon Express representative declined to comment on this story, but noted that the company is very optimistic about its proposal. Moon Express is not the only company seeking for the rights to travel to outer space. Elon Musk's Space 10, 
aims to send an unmanned aircraft to Mars by 2018. Questions 5 to 7 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 5. What is the news report mainly about? Question 6. What is Moon Express planning to do? Question 7. What does Moon Express think of its mission? Section B. Directions. In this section, you will hear two long conversations. At the end of each conversation, you will hear four questions. Both the conversation and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the centre. Conversation 1 Hey Sophia, how are you doing? Hi, Bob. I'm good, thanks. Actually, I'm on holiday with my family in Thailand at the moment, although I wish it were with my friends instead. Really? You never said you were going to Thailand. How I envy you. I've only been here a week, but, you know, Thailand's an amazing place. I'm having a great time here. In fact, I'm now lying on the beach in Phuket. I've been in the sun for around 15 minutes only, and I'm already getting sunburnt. Have you been here before? No, I wish I had. What else have you been doing in Thailand besides enjoying the sun? Well, I met a guy from Germany yesterday. He showed me around the orphanage he works at. There, I met many volunteer teachers who are mainly young people from Europe. Ah, that's interesting. Yes, I also made a new little friend, Sarah. She was so cute. I was so sad when I had to leave at the end of the day. If I ever come back to Thailand, I'd definitely visit this place again as a volunteer. Well, you can tell me all about it when you get back. My phone battery is almost dead now. Remember to get me something from the souvenir shops. I like to collect bits and pieces from different parts of the world. Bye now. Enjoy yourself, Sophia. Bye. Questions 8 to 11 are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question 8. What does the woman say she is doing now? Question 9. What did the woman do yesterday? Question 10. Why does the man have to end the conversation? Question 11. Why does the man ask the woman to bring him something from Thailand? Conversation 2. Hi, David. There's a new gym opening in town today. Would you like to go with me this afternoon? Yes, more than glad to. I haven't been to a gym for ages. I need to do some exercise to tone up. 
then this is a good chance. They sent me an invitation with a note saying I could take a friend for free on the first day. Also, if we both sign up before Friday, we can get a discount on a six-month membership. Great. Count me in. I really want to lose some of this belly fat and turn it into muscle. But I'm not sure which of the gym equipment would best help. Well, I'm no expert at that, but I think you can try lifting weights and do at least 200 sit-ups twice a day. I've never tried weightlifting before. Is it dangerous? No, not at all. If you know some of the basics, don't worry, I'll show you the ropes. I used to practice this at another gym before my membership ended. I'll be your personal trainer. Thank you. What other equipment do they have? Well, like all gyms, they have all sorts of things to help build up muscles in different parts of the body, like upright bicycles, chest stretching machines, and running machines. You could use any of these to suit your purpose. Now, the gym opens at noon, so can we meet up in town at 1.30 p.m.? Perfect. See you there, coach. Questions 12 to 15 are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question 12. What are the speakers talking about? Question 13. What does the gym offer at its opening? Question 14. What is the man concerned about? Question 15. What do we learn about the woman from the conversation? Section C. Directions. In this section, you will hear three passages. At the end of each passage, you will hear three or four questions. Both the passage and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C and D. Then, mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the centre. Passage 1 In today's job market, it's not uncommon for job seekers to submit applications for many positions. That involves lots of time and lots of work to organize. Certainly, you don't want to waste your precious hours on following the developments in a disorderly fashion and miss important deadlines, confuse interview times, or forget to follow up as a result. Accordingly, Managing your job search properly is just as important as identifying job opportunities and submitting your applications. If you're familiar with Microsoft Excel or a similar program, creating a table is a simple and effective way to keep track of your job applications. If Excel isn't quite your cup of tea, don't worry. You can create a table in Microsoft Word or a similar word processor. Google is another tool to help you get organized effectively. If you have a Gmail account, you can create, save, and send tables in addition to written documents like your cover letter and resume. You can also link up with Google Calendar to make sure you stay on top of important dates. Clearly, there are plenty of ways to keep track of your job search and making the effort to simplify your job search will pay off. Nevertheless, 
You should always focus on quality, not quantity. Only apply for positions you are qualified for, and make each application count. Personalizing each cover letter and updating and editing your resume. Questions 16 to 18 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 16. What does the speaker say about today's job seekers? Question 17. What can job applicants do with the help of Google? Question 18. What does the speaker suggest job seekers do? Passage 2. Some people say, if kids didn't have to go to school, they'd all be out in the streets. My reply is, no, they wouldn't. First, even if schools stayed just the way they are, children would spend at least some time there because that's where they'd be likely to find friends. Second, schools wouldn't stay the way they are. They'd get better because we would have to start making them what they ought to be right now. Last, if we stirred up our brains and gave children a little help, those who did not want to go to school could find other things to do, things many children now do during their holidays. There's something easier we could do. We need to get kids out of the school buildings, give them a chance to learn about the world at first hand. In Philadelphia and Portland, Oregon, plans are being drawn up for public schools that won't have any school buildings at all. That will take the students out into the city and help them to use it and its people as a resource. In other words, students, perhaps in groups, perhaps independently, will go to libraries, museums, exhibitions, courtrooms, radio and TV stations, meetings, businesses and laboratories to learn about their world and society at first hand. A small private school in Washington is already doing this. It makes sense. We need more of it. Questions 19 to 21 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 19. What are some people worried about, according to the speaker? Question 20. What does the speaker think we could do for kids who dislike school? Question 21. What does the speaker say is the easier thing we could do? Passage 3. Before there was the written word, there was the language of dance. Dance expresses love and hate joy and sorrow, life and death, and everything else in between. Dance in America is everywhere. We dance from Florida to Alaska, from horizon to horizon, and coast to coast. We dance at weddings, birthdays, office parties, or just to fill the time. I adore dancing, says Lester Bridges, the owner of a dance studio in a small town in Iowa. I can't imagine doing anything else with my life. 
Bridges runs dance classes for all ages. Teaching dance is wonderful. My older students say it makes them feel young. It's marvelous to watch them. For many of them, it's a way of meeting people and having a social life. So why do we dance? I can tell you about one young couple, says Bridges. They arrive at the class in a bad mood and they leave with a smile. Dancing seems to change their mood completely. So, do we dance in order to make ourselves feel better, calmer, healthier? Andrea Hillier, a dance teacher, says, Dance, like the rhythm of a beating heart, is life. Even after all these years, I want to get better and better. I keep practicing even when I'm exhausted. I find it hard to stop. Dancing reminds me I'm alive. Questions 22 to 25 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 22. What does the passage say about dance in America? Question 23. What do we know about Lester Bridges' dance studio? Question 24. What happened to the young couple after they attended Lester Bridges' class? Question 25. What did Andrea Hillier say about dancing? This is the end of listening comprehension. College English Test, Band 4, Part 2. Listening Comprehension, Section A. Directions. In this section, you will hear three news reports. At the end of each news report, you will hear two or three questions. Both the news report and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C and D. Then, mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the center. News Report 1 A device that weighs less than one kilogram is part of a mission that will allow scientists to deliver fourth generation, or 4G, mobile coverage to the moon in 2019. If successful, the tiny device will provide the moon with its first ever mobile phone network. The lunar network will support high-definition streaming of video and data between the moon and Earth. The network is part of Mission to the Moon. This is a project with the goal of landing the first privately paid for mission to the moon. The 4G mission is set to launch from Cape Canaveral in the United States on a SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket in 2019. Mission to the Moon intends to establish and test the first elements of a communications network on the moon. The scientists working on the project opted to build a 4G rather than a fifth generation or 5G network. This is because fifth generation networks are still in testing and trial phases. This means that a 5G network may not yet be stable enough to work on the moon's surface. Questions 1 and 2 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 1. What are scientists planning to do? Question 2. 
Question 2. Why did scientists choose to set up a 4G network in their mission? News Report 2. Firefighters responded to a fire Wednesday night at an abandoned mall in Hayward. The fire was reported at 9.26 p.m. at an old shopping center on Mission Avenue near St. Mary's Church. Six fire engines, two trucks and two chiefs responded to the scene. Crews had the fire under control in about 45 minutes and managed to contain the fire to its point of origin. There were some people inside the building when the fire broke out, but there were no reports of any injuries. Fire investigators have responded to the scene, but have not yet determined the cause of the fire. Firefighters will remain on the scene until later this morning to ensure that the fire doesn't start up again. The shopping mall had not been in use since 2002. In 2014, City Hall developed a plan to knock down the building and replace it with affordable housing. However, the plan was dropped due to lack of funds. Questions 3 and 4 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 3. What does the news item say about the fire? Question 4. What had City Hall planned to do? News Report 3. Potato chips in Japan are being sold for six times their normal price. This is after the country's main manufacturer stopped sales due to a potato shortage. Storms and floods in its main potato growing region last year caused the worst harvest in more than three decades. Local media reports suggest Kalbi and its main rival Koikiya are halting almost 50 products. We don't know when we'll be able to restart, a company spokesman said. Snack lovers are panic buying, and many supermarket shelves are bare. Japanese laws limit the amount of imported potatoes that can be used in Japanese-made products. Japan says fear of disease is its main reason to block fresh imports. It still only allows potatoes from selected U.S. states. This is only at certain times and on condition that they are processed at factories based near Japanese ports. But global warming has raised the possibility that domestic produce could be seriously affected by rare weather events more often. Questions 5 to 7 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 5. What problem is Japan facing? Question 6. Why does Japan limit the import of potatoes? Question 7. What might affect Japanese domestic produce? Section B. Directions. In this section, you will hear two long conversations. At the end of each conversation, you will hear four questions. Both the conversation and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, 
you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet one with a single line through the center. Conversation one. Mr. Brown's lectures are so boring. Yes, he is not a very exciting speaker, but the subject is interesting. During every one of his lectures, I try to listen. I really try, but after about ten minutes, my mind begins to wander and I lose concentration. But I see that you seem to be okay. How do you stay focused through the entire hour? Well, what I do is keep my pen moving. What do you mean? It's a method of active concentration I read about. One of the most effective ways to concentrate is to write things down, but it has to be done by hand, not typing on a keyboard. You see, writing by hand forces you to actually engage with what you're learning in a more physical way. Do you review your notes afterwards then? Sometimes, but that's not important. My notes may or may not be useful, but the point is that by writing down what Mr. Brown says. I can follow his line of thinking more easily. In fact, sometimes I draw a little too. You draw in class, and that helps you pay attention. Yes, honestly, it works for me. I just draw little lines and nonsense, really. It was also in that article I read. It can keep the mind active, prevent getting bored, and help to concentrate. Again. The point is to listen hard while keeping the pen moving. If I'm at home and I need to study, what I do is read out loud. It has a similar effect to writing by hand. It helps memorize information in a physical way. Questions eight to eleven are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question eight: What does the man think of Mr. Brown's lectures? Question nine: What does the woman do during Mr. Brown's lectures? Question ten: Why does the woman draw in class? Question eleven: What does the woman say about reading out loud? Conversation two. And where's this? These photos are from the Taj Mahal in India. We went there about ten years ago for our honeymoon. Was it romantic? Yeah, the Taj Mahal was a very romantic place. The guide told us there is a famous love story behind this building that all Indians learn in school. I think it was during the 1600s, and the princess at the time died while giving birth to her 14th child. The emperor loved the princess so much, and was so sad when she died. That he ordered the palace to be built in her honor. Wow, that sounds very romantic. It looks amazing. Yes, it's gorgeous. It's also larger in real life than it looks in the photos. The building is very tall, and there are gardens and a wall around it all. It's all built in this white stone, and some walls of the building are decorated with jewels. It must have been very crowded when you were there. Yes, it's a very famous tourist destination, so there are thousands of visitors every day. Was the rest of India crowded? Yes, very crowded in many cities. It was sometimes so crowded that it was difficult to walk along the streets, especially through busy markets. And there are so many cars. Traffic was terrible. 
But the people are friendly. The culture is amazing, and we had a great time. What about the food? Indian food is great. There are lots of different dishes to try, and every region has its own special food. Questions twelve to fifteen are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question twelve: For what purpose did the woman go to India? Question thirteen: Why was the Taj Mahal built? Question fourteen: What does the woman say about the Taj Mahal? Question fifteen: What is the woman's impression of Indian cities? Section C, directions. In this section, you will hear three passages. At the end of each passage, you will hear three or four questions. Both the passage and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter. On answer sheet one, with a single line through the center. Passage one: A Pew Research Center survey of more than 1,000 Americans, conducted in April 2016, finds that Americans continue to express largely positive views about the current state of their local public libraries. For instance. Around three quarters say that public libraries provide them with the resources they need, and 66% say the closing of their local public library would have a major impact on their community. Although notably, just 33% say this would have a major impact on them personally or on their family. A majority of Americans feel libraries are doing a good job of providing a safe place for people to hang out or spend time, as well as opening up educational opportunities for people of all ages. And roughly half think their libraries contribute a lot to their communities in terms of helping spark creativity among young people and providing a trusted place for people to learn about new technologies. As in past Pew Research Center surveys of library use, the April 2016 survey also measured Americans' usage of and engagement with libraries. Overall, 53% of Americans, ages 16 and older, have had some interaction with a public library in the past year, either through an in-person visit or using a library website. Some 48% of adults specifically visited a library in the past 12 months, a modest increase from the 44% who said that in late 2015. Questions 16 to 18 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 16: What do most Americans say about local public libraries? Question seventeen: How can local public libraries benefit young people? Question eighteen: What does the two thousand sixteen survey show about adult library users?
Passage 2. A savanna cat is a crossbreed between a domestic cat and a medium-sized wild African cat called the serval. The unusual cross became popular among breeders at the end of the 1990s, and in 2001, the International Cat Association accepted it as a new registered breed. The savannas are tall and slim and can weigh up to 9.1 kilograms, making them one of the largest breeds of cats that people can own. They have a spotted coat similar to that of many types of wild cats, and their ears are very large. They are also commonly compared to dogs in their loyalty and can be trained to walk on a lead and to fetch. An often noted characteristic of the savanna is its jumping ability. They are known to jump on top of doors and high cabinets. Some can leap about 2.5 meters high from a standing position. Cats are typically known for being very inquisitive, and so are the savannas. They often learn how to open doors and cupboards. Many savanna cats do not fear water and will play with or even dive into water. Some owners even shower with their savanna cats. Presenting a water bowl to a savanna may also prove a challenge, as some will promptly begin to bat all the water out of the bowl until it is empty using their front paws. Questions 19 to 21 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 19. What do we learn about the savanna cat? Question 20. What is characteristic of savanna cats? Question 21. What do some people do with their savanna cats? Passage 3. When children start school for the very first time, parents often feel a sense of excitement coupled with a touch of sadness at the end of an era. This is the start of a new adventure for children, playing and interacting with new friends, sharing, taking turns and settling into a new routine. But of course, this is not the start of your child's education, which in fact began at birth. Back then, you would have been your child's most influential teachers. During this time at home, your child would have learned more than at any other period in their life. During your child's first year in school, much time will be spent in learning to read, and they need to know that this is fun and worthwhile. Your child will naturally copy you, so it is important that you are seen reading and enjoying books, newspapers and magazines, rather than just absorbed in screens. Ultimately, an excellent education should be a close partnership between parents and teachers. A child's year splits fairly neatly into thirds, a third at school, a third asleep, and a third awake at home or on holiday. Irrespective of the quality of a school, a child's home life is of key importance. It is the determining factor of their academic success. Your child may have started on a new journey, but your work is far from finished. Questions 22 to 25 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 22. How do parents feel when their children start going to school? Question 23. What does the passage say about children's education? Question 
Question 24. What should parents do for the success of their children's education? Question 25. What does the passage say is the key factor of children's academic success? College English Test Band 4 Part 2 Listening Comprehension Section A Directions In this section, you will hear three news reports. At the end of each news report, you will hear two or three questions. Both the news report and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C and D. Then, mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the centre. News Report 1 Rescue crews pulled a man to safety after a collapse at a construction site in Brooklyn on Tuesday. The incident happened on the 400 block of Rutland Road just after 12.30 p.m. The Fire Department of New York says the vacant 100-year-old building being pulled down partially collapsed. A man described as a non-worker civilian was buried up to his waist in the basement. The man was collecting building materials when the first floor collapsed underneath him. He was trapped under a beam about 10 feet below the surface for nearly an hour and a half. The man was then taken to hospital. Officials said he is in stable condition with non-life-threatening injuries. The building was reportedly purchased by a neighboring church in 2011. It was the site of a 2006 fire and has remained vacant ever since. Questions 1 and 2 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 1. What happened at a construction site in Brooklyn on Tuesday? Question 2. What does the report say about the non-worker civilian? News Report 2. Millions of people are struggling to understand their paychecks or calculate money in shops, campaigners have said. Being bad at maths should no longer be seen as a badge of honour or down to genetics, according to National Numeracy, a new organisation which aims to challenge the nation's negative view of the subject. Chris Humphreys, chairman of the group, said that poor math skills can affect an individual's life, leaving them at a higher risk of being excluded from school or out of work. Figures from a government survey, published last year, show that 17 million adults in England have basic math skills that are, at best, the same as an 11-year-old, he said. Speaking at the launch of National Numeracy, Mr Humphreys said, that's a scary figure, because what it means is they often can't calculate or give change. Mike Ellicock, chief executive of National Numeracy, said, we want to challenge this I can't do maths attitude that is prevalent in the UK, adding that it was vital that all primary school teachers understand key maths concepts as young children who fail to learn the basics will suffer later on. Questions 3 and 4 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 3. What does the organisation National Numeracy aim to do? Question 4. What is vital according to the Chief Executive of National Numeracy?
News Report 3. The Dutch king has revealed that for more than two decades, he has held down a part-time second job, alongside his royal duties. King Willem Alexander of the Netherlands said that he recently ended his role as a regular guest pilot after 21 years with the National Airlines fleet of now outdated aircraft. As a guest flyer, the king worked about twice a month, always as co-pilot. He will now retrain to fly the bigger Boeing 737s, as the old planes are being phased out of service. The 50-year-old father of three and king to 17 million Dutch citizens calls flying a hobby. It lets him leave his royal duties on the ground and fully focus on something else. You have an aircraft, passengers, and crew. You have responsibility for them, the king said. You can't take your problems from the ground into the skies. You can completely change focus and concentrate on something else. That, for me, is the most relaxing part of flying. Willem Alexander said he is rarely recognized by passengers. Very few people pay attention to him as he walks through the airport in his airline uniform and cap. Questions 5 to 7 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 5. What does the report say about the Dutch king? Question 6. Why does the king say he likes flying? Question 7. What does the king say about passengers at the airport? Section B. Directions. In this section, you will hear two long conversations. At the end of each conversation, you will hear four questions. Both the conversation and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the center. Conversation 1 Morning, Miss Amino. Welcome to our studio. Thanks. My pleasure. Okay, then. Let me start by asking you how old your company is. My grandparents started the company in 1955. Why did they decide to open a furniture plant in Bucharest? At the time, there was a construction boom. There was a great need for furniture, and my grandparents saw a business opportunity. Their aim was to provide quality, yet affordable wooden furniture, and this goal has never changed. Do you still only work with wood? That's right. It's what we know and what we do best. If we started trying different materials, our quality would probably suffer. And all the wood is local? Correct. A hundred percent of our raw material comes from Romania. Could you please outline How the company has grown over time? What have been the main challenges and opportunities that you have faced? Well, back in the 50s and 60s, Romania was a lot poorer than it is today. My grandfather and father did not have much capital, and our customers didn't have much money either. So that limited growth. The big change was in 2007, when Romania joined the European Union. Suddenly, our market exploded in size and we could now sell our products all across the continent. There was also more financial investment and, as a result, we went from having 20 employees to 200. Which countries are your biggest market? Besides Romania, our biggest market is Germany. 
there is strong demand there for our traditional style of furniture. Questions eight to eleven are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question eight: Why did Semino's grandparents start a furniture plant in Bucharest? Question nine: What was Semino's grandfather trying to do? Question ten: What does Semino say about her company's raw materials? Question eleven: Where does Semino's company sell their products? Conversation two: Have you heard about the new restaurant, The Pearl? Susan and I are going to try it out this weekend. We have a reservation on Saturday at seven o'clock. I can call to add two more to the table if you'd like. That sounds great. We'd love to join you. You always seem to know the best places to go. Where do you hear about these things? I have a habit of reading Six One Four magazine. It has all the information on local events within the Six One Four calling code area. That's a clever name for the magazine, then. Does it only focus on new restaurant openings? They have other information too, things like concerts, festivals, and small shops. I think the restaurant information and reviews are the most exciting, though. Each year, they also sponsor a local event called Restaurant Week. Restaurant Week? What's that? Oh, it's wonderful! All the stylish restaurants participate. They have special set menus for the week, usually in spring. At a number of different price points, Susan and I go to at least three different places during the event. It's a great opportunity to try some of the more expensive restaurants at a discounted price and try something new. That's how we found the Pearl, actually. Wow, that's an event I would be interested in. When will it be happening this year? You're in luck. Restaurant Week starts in just a few days, the first Sunday in May. Let's make sure to set a double date during the event. Just let me know what type of food you would like to try. Okay, I will. Questions twelve to fifteen are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question twelve: What does the man invite the woman to do this weekend? Question thirteen: What does the man say about Six One Four magazine? Question fourteen: What does the man usually do with Susan during Restaurant Week? Question fifteen: Why does the man say the woman is in luck? Section C: Directions. In this section, you will hear three passages. At the end of each passage. You will hear three or four questions. Both the passage and the questions 
will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the center. Passage 1 All parents know it is difficult to get children to eat their vegetables. Some of them offer rewards or treats for children finishing their share. But researchers have discovered that youngsters who are not praised for trying vegetables are more likely to eat them eventually. The study found that the best way to get children to eat food they do not like is simply to give them repeated exposure to it. A psychologist from Ghent University in Belgium studied 98 children. They gave them five kinds of vegetables to eat – mushrooms, peas, eggplants, carrots and cabbages. The taste tests revealed that carrots were the least liked vegetable among youngsters. The children were then given a bowl of boiled carrots and told to choose how much to eat. After eight minutes, they were asked to rate the dish as delicious, just okay or disgusting. The trial went on twice a week for a month, with a follow-up taste test after eight weeks. Children were split into three groups with one group asked to try the bowl of carrots repeatedly with no further encouragement. The other two groups were given rewards of a toy or verbal praise. After the trial, 81% of children who simply tried the carrots consistently liked them. This is in contrast to 68% for the group given a toy and 75% for the group given verbal praise. Questions 16 to 18 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 16. What is the best way to get children to eat vegetables according to a recent study? Question 17. What did the researchers find about carrots? Question 18. What does the result of this research show? Passage 2. One thing about the moon many people don't know is that it has a lot of garbage on its surface, left over from human space exploration. But how much garbage, exactly, have humans left on the moon? It's hard to be accurate, but the trash likely weighs more than 181,000 kilograms on Earth. Much of it was left by American astronauts who landed on the lunar surface between 1969 and 1972 during NASA's Apollo missions. The other rubbish comes from missions that did not have human crews. These missions were conducted by various space exploring agencies, including those from the US, Russia, Japan, India, and Europe. Many of the older pieces are equipment sent to learn about the moon. The equipment stayed there after its missions ended. The moon is also home to lunar orbiters that mapped the moon before they crashed into its surface, adding to the garbage heap. The objects left by the Apollo astronauts included equipment that was no longer needed. Bringing back unneeded equipment would have used up precious resources such as fuel. But as the saying goes, one person's trash is another's treasure. Researchers can study the garbage left on the moon to see how its materials weathered the radiation and vacuum of space over time. Moreover, some of the objects on the moon are still being used, including a laser range reflector left by the Apollo 11 crew. Questions 19 to 21 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 19. 
what does the passage say may be unknown to many people. Question 20. Why has a lot of equipment been left on the moon? Question 21. What can researchers do with the garbage on the moon? Passage 3. In my line of work, I receive a lot of emails. I also send a lot of emails. Though social media and messaging apps have taken over some of the roles from email as a form of communication, email is likely to retain an important role for business communication in the future. Surprisingly, though, a lot of companies and organisations lack formal guidelines for emailing. As most of you will soon be entering the workforce, I would like to share with you my own rules for emailing. If someone sends you an email, reply to them acknowledging the email. A simple thank you lets the sender know that their email has arrived safely, that it has not been lost among what could be 50 other emails that have arrived in your email inbox that day. It's not necessary to reply to a mass email sent to numerous recipients. These emails are often informative rather than personalised correspondence requiring a response or action. But it's common politeness to respond to a personal message, preferably within 24 hours of receiving it. It's also important to use proper English. Just because emails are a quick form of communication doesn't mean emails, especially business emails, should be written using informal, shortened forms of words. Think of an email as a letter. Spelling, grammar and punctuation should not be overlooked and never use capitals to emphasise a word or words in an email. It's the same as yelling. Questions 22 to 25 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 22. What does the passage say about email? Question 23. What should one do upon receiving a personalized email? Question 24. What does the passage say about a mass email? Question 25. What should one do when writing a business email? This is the end of listening comprehension. College English Test Band 4 Part 2 Listening Comprehension Section A. Directions. In this section, you will hear three news reports. At the end of each news report, you will hear two or three questions. Both the news report and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C and D. Then, mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1, 
with a single line through the center. News Report One: One of Google's self-driving cars crashed into a bus in California last month. There were no injuries. It is not the first time one of Google's famed self-driving cars has been involved in a crash, but it may be the first time it has caused one. On February 14th, the self-driving car, traveling at two miles per hour, pulled out in front of a public bus going 15 miles per hour. The man in the Google vehicle reported that he assumed the bus would slow down to let the car out. And so he did not switch to the manual mode. In a statement, Google said, "We clearly bear some responsibility because if our car hadn't moved, there wouldn't have been a crash." That said, our test driver believed the bus was going to slow or stop to allow us to merge into the traffic, and that there would be sufficient space to do that. The company's self-driving cars have done well. Over a million miles across various states in the U.S., and until now, have only reported minor accidents. Questions one and two are based on the news report you have just heard. Question one: According to Google, what was the cause of the accident? Question two: How have Google's self-driving cars performed so far? News report two: Thousands of bees left the town after landing on the back of a car when their queen got stuck in its boot. Tom Moses, who works at a nearby national park, noticed a brown patch on the back of the car after the owner parked it to do some shopping. When he looked closer, he realized it was a huge group of bees. Moses said, "I've never seen that many bees in one spot. It was very unusual. They were very close together, and there was a lot of noise and movement." It was interesting to see such a strange sight, but there were a lot of people around, and I was a bit worried about the bees and the people stopping to look. I thought that someone might do something stupid. Moses called two local bee specialists, who helped remove the bees by attracting them into a box. Moses spent three hours looking after the bees, and was stung five times. He said, "My stings are a bit painful, but I'm pleased it all worked out and I could help. People need to realize that bees are valuable, and they should be looked after." Questions three and four are based on the news report you have just heard. Question three: What do we learn about Tom Moses? Question four: What do we know about the bees on the back of the car? News report three: A new species of snake has been discovered on a remote island in the Bahamas. Scientists identified twenty of the one-meter-long snakes during two trips to the Caribbean islands. The second trip was made in October last year. One of the creatures made a dramatic appearance by moving on to the head of the team leader as he slept. The snake has been named Silver Boa because it is metal-colored, and the first specimen found was climbing a silver palm tree. The team was led by Dr. Graham Reynolds from Harvard University. The scientist confirmed the snake was a previously unknown species after conducting a genetic analysis of tissue samples. 
Commenting on the find, snake expert Robert Henderson from the Milwaukee Museum of Natural History said, "Worldwide new species of frogs are being discovered and described quite regularly. New species of snakes, however, are much rarer." Questions five to seven are based on the news report you have just heard. Question five: What is the news report mainly about? Question six: What do we learn about the scientific team leader? Question seven: How did the newly discovered creature get its name? Section B: Directions. In this section, you will hear two long conversations. At the end of each conversation. You will hear four questions. Both the conversation and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet one with a single line through the center. Conversation one. Did you enjoy your stay with us, Mr. Brown? Yes, very much. I had a wonderful time here. Now I'm going to the airport. My flight leaves in less than two hours. So could you tell me what's the quickest way to get there? Well, we can call a taxi for you. We also have a free airport shuttle service. That sounds great. But will the shuttle get me to the airport in time? Yes, it should. The next shuttle leaves in 15 minutes, and it takes some 25 minutes to get to the airport. Fantastic! I'll just wait in the lobby. Will you please let me know when it's leaving? Of course, sir. Now I would like to settle my minibar bill. How much is that? Let's see. It comes to thirty-seven dollars and fifty cents. How would you like to pay for it? I'll pay with my credit card. Thanks. But I'll need a receipt so I can charge it to my company. Absolutely. Here you are, sir. If you like, you can leave your bags with the porter, and he can load them onto the shuttle for you when it arrives. That would be great. Thank you. Would you like to leave a comment on our web page when you have time? Sure. I had a really good stay here, and I'd like to recommend your hotel to my friends and colleagues. That's very kind of you. Thank you again for staying at Sheraton Hotel. Questions eight to eleven are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question eight: Why does the man ask about the quickest way to the airport? Question nine: How is the man going to pay his bill? Question ten: What did the man ask the woman to do? Question eleven: What favor does the woman ask of the man? Conversation two. You know Ben's given up making those terrible faces he used to make. The other day, he came home from school. 
almost in tears. His teacher said if he went on like that, his face would get stuck when the wind changed. And he believed her? Yeah, he's only a little boy. Don't you remember all those things we used to believe when we were little? I remember my Aunt Mary used to say, if you swallow a cherry stone, a tree will grow out of your mouth. And I'm still terrified today, sort of subconsciously, you know, if I swallow one by mistake. Yeah, I suppose you're right. The one that used to get me was that swans could break your leg with a blow of the wing. They can, can't they? I always thought they could. No, they're not that strong. But there's another one even more terrifying, that is, if you put a postage stamp on upside down, you'll go to prison. No, never heard of that. But my grandmother was a terror for that kind of thing. For example, she would say you'll get a spot on your tongue if you tell a lie. If you eat stale bread, your hair will curl. And here's one more. We went on a camping trip once in Italy, and my wife spent the whole time worrying about bats getting into her hair. She said her grandmother reckoned you had to shave your head to get it out. My wife was really terrified. Silly, isn't it? But that's how some parents try to keep their kids from doing the wrong thing or getting into trouble. Questions 12 to 15 are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question 12. What does the man say about Ben? Question 13. What did Aunt Mary used to do when the man was a child? Question 14. What does the woman believe swans could do? Question 15. What did the grandmother of the man's wife say? Section C. Directions. In this section, you will hear three passages. At the end of each passage, you will hear three or four questions. Both the passage and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the center. Passage 1 If I could go back in history and live when I liked, I wouldn't go back very far. In fact, I'd like to relive a period I've already lived. The 1960s. I was in my 20s, and everything was being renewed. People were coming out of a formal and almost Victorian attitude, and you really felt anything was possible. Meeting people was the thing, and you went to coffee bars, where you met friends and spent the evening. The cinema, the theater, all that was very exciting, with new things coming out. In fact, we seemed to be out all the time. I don't really remember working. Of course, I was a student, or sitting around at home very much. That just wasn't where the scene was, even eating. It was the first time ordinary people started going out to eat. We were beginning to be adventurous about food, but we were more interested in meeting people than in eating or drinking. And dress, yes, that was the revolution. I mean... Girls went around in really short skirts and wore flowers in their hair, and men were in jeans 
and could wear their hair long too. It was a wonderful period. It was like living in an age you could never have imagined. And that never has come back. We didn't have much money, but it didn't matter, and there was plenty of opportunity to do whatever you felt like doing. Questions 16 to 18 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 16. Why does the speaker say he would like to relive the 1960s? Question 17. What does the speaker say was the most popular thing to do at that time? Question 18. What do we learn about the speaker? Passage 2. Dogs, man's best friends, have a clear strategy for dealing with angry owners. They look away. New research shows that dogs limit their eye contact with angry humans. The scientists suggest this may be an attempt to calm humans down. This behavior may have evolved as dogs gradually learned they could benefit from avoiding conflicts with humans. To conduct the tests, the University of Helsinki researchers trained 31 dogs to rest in front of a video screen. Facial photos of dogs and humans were displayed on the screen for 1.5 seconds. They showed threatening, pleasant and neutral expressions. Nearby cameras tracked the dog's eye movements. Dogs in the study looked most at the eyes of humans and other dogs to sense their emotions. When dogs looked at expressions of angry dogs, their eyes rested more on the mouth, perhaps to interpret the threatening expressions. And when looking at angry humans, they tended to turn away their gaze. Dogs may have learned to detect threat signs from humans and respond by trying to make peace. According to researcher Sani Sompi, avoiding conflicts may have helped dogs develop better bonds with humans. The researchers also note that dogs scan faces as a whole to sense how people are feeling, instead of focusing on a given feature. They suggest this indicates that dogs aren't sensing emotions from a single feature, but piecing to gather information from all facial features just as humans do. Questions 19 to 21 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 19. What do dogs do when they are faced with angry humans? Question 20. What does a dog do when it sees the expressions of angry dogs? Question 21. How does a dog sense people's feelings? Passage 3. Winter in many places is very cold. There is lots of snow around and the ground freezes which can make life difficult for animals. People in cold places live in warm houses and have learned to adapt. What do animals do? There are three main ways that animals survive the cold in winter. Sleep, adapt, or migrate. Some animals, such as bears, frogs, and snakes, sleep all winter. They sleep very deeply 
and need little or no food. While sleeping, their body temperature drops and their heartbeat slows down. To prepare for this before winter, these animals eat extra food to become fat, which gives them the energy they need while they sleep. Other animals adapt, for example, by staying active in winter. It is often hard for them to find food, so some animals, such as mice, collect extra food before winter and hide it. When winter comes, they return to the hiding places to eat the food. Some animals grow thicker fur or live in tree holes or underground to stay warm. Some birds migrate by flying to a warmer place for the winter, where they can find more food. Some fly very long distances, including one kind of bird that flies from the remote north of the world all the way to the distant south. Some birds fly in groups for safety, while others fly alone. Questions 22 to 25 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 22. What does the speaker say about animals in winter? Question 23. What do we learn about animals that sleep through winter? Question 24. How do animals like mice adapt to the severe winter? Question 25. Why do some birds fly in groups when migrating, according to the speaker? This is the end of listening comprehension. College English Test, Band 4, Part 2, Listening Comprehension Section A, Directions In this section, you will hear three news reports. At the end of each news report, you will hear two or three questions. Both the news report and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then, mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the center. News Report 1. Automakers and tech companies are working hard to offer the first true self-driving car. But 75% of drivers say they wouldn't feel safe in such a vehicle. Still, 60% of drivers would like to get some kind of self-driving feature, such as automatic braking or self-parking, the next time they buy a new car. The attitudes are published in a new AAA survey of 1,800 drivers. Advocates of self-driving cars argue they would be safer than in cars driven by humans because they wouldn't get distracted or drive when tired. But those surveyed by AAA say they trust their own driving skills. Many feel the technology is too new and unproven. John Nielsen, AAA's Managing Director of Automotive Engineering and Repair, said tests suggest drivers may be overestimating their own abilities. He also believes they will be more likely to trust self-driving cars as they become more familiar with features such as automatic braking or parking. He estimated that the comfort level will increase considerably in 5 to 10 years. Questions 1 and 2 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 1. What is the finding of the AAA survey?
Question two: What does John Nielsen say about self-driving cars? News report two. One dog has been killed, and multiple dogs have been injured by a snowmobile driver in what appears to be an intentional attack on competitors in the Idita Rod race in Alaska. Ali Zirkel was the first to report an attack. A snowmobile driver had repeatedly attempted to harm her and her team, and one of Zirkel's dogs had received a non-life-threatening injury. Zirkel reported the attack when she arrived in Nulato, Alaska, in the early hours of the morning. Then, Jeff King, a four-time champion, reported a similar attack. His team was hit by a snowmobile driver, injuring several dogs and killing a three-year-old male dog. Reporter Zachariah Hughes says that neither King nor Zirkel was injured, although this incident. Very much alters the race of the two participants competing for a win. Both are going to continue on their way toward the finish line. Alaska State Troopers released a statement saying they've arrested Arnold Demoski, 26. He faces trial on several charges. Questions three and four are based on the news report you have just heard. Question three. What is the news report mainly about? Question 4. What do we learn about Jeff King? News Report 3. A tour boat turned over off the coast of Nicaragua, killing at least 13 people and leaving more passengers missing, officials said. The boat was carrying 32 people, 25 Costa Ricans, 4 Americans, and 3 Nicaraguans. The 13 dead were all Costa Rican, the foreign ministry said. The boat traveling between Nicaragua's Big Corn Island and Little Corn Island turned over Saturday near the larger island. Some passengers remain missing, the Costa Rican Foreign Ministry said, but did not specify how many. A local radio said an unspecified number of people were rescued, including the tour boat's owner, Hilario Blandon. Nicaraguan naval authorities had banned sea travel in the area because of bad weather and strong winds, but the tour boat proceeded anyway. Blandon, the boat's owner, has been arrested by Nicaraguan authorities, the state-run news agency said. Both he and a crew member are being investigated for unintentional murder and exposing people to danger, according to police. Questions 5 to 7 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 5. What happened to the tour boat sailing off the Nicaraguan coast? Question 6. How many people was the boat carrying? Question 7. What do we know about the owner of the boat? Section B. Directions. In this section, you will hear two long conversations. 
At the end of each conversation, you will hear four questions. Both the conversation and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet one with a single line through the center. Conversation one. Hi, Susan. You're looking very smart today. I always look smart, James. Actually, I'm on my way to a job interview. What job? Oh, you mean for the summer holidays? Yeah, there's only two weeks to go. I've got a second interview with that big foreign accountancy firm in the city center. You know the one. That's fantastic. The work is just helping out with data input, you know. But the pay isn't too bad. It might suit you too. I know they have at least two temporary positions available, and I don't think they have anyone else yet. Hmm. If they take you on, tell them you know a friend who'd be really good too. I really need the money, and the experience would look good on my resume. Maybe we'll be working together. The dream team. Okay, we'll do. If the boss likes me, I'll mention it. It'll be good to have someone around who I know. I'll phone you afterwards, but perhaps you should put in an application anyway. Thanks, Susan. That's great. Listen, do you want a lift to the city? I have my dad's car today, and nothing else to do this morning. Sure. Thanks, James. Let's go then. The car's over there. By the way, how's your knowledge of accountancy? The interviewer may ask you about it. No problem. I think I can survive. I might just have to review a few accountancy terms. Maybe you can give me a practice interview first. Of course. Let's go then. Don't want to be late. Questions eight to eleven are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question eight: Where will Susan probably get a job? Question nine: What will Susan's future job involve? Question ten: Why does James want the job in that company? Question eleven: What does James say he will have to do to prepare for the interview? Conversation two. There is new data out today that confirms that many Americans are not good at math, and when it comes to everyday technology skills, we are dead last when compared to other developed countries. Here's Gabriel Emanuel of National Public Radio. Let's start with the bad news that Americans are terrible at technology skills: using email, naming a file on a computer. Using a link on a web page, or just texting someone. No country scored below the U.S. Only one country, Poland, performed as poorly as we did. Who came out the first? Japan did the best, and then Finland. If you look at data about reading and math, you'll notice something interesting. Young adults who went to college or graduate school. Were doing pretty well. In literacy, they were actually doing better than their peers in other countries. So that's a bit of good news. But when you look at Americans who have a high school diploma, 
they look a lot like other countries' high school dropouts. We have a lot of work to do. That is especially true when it comes to math. You go to the store and there's a sale. Buy one, get the second one half off. You decide to buy two. How much do you pay? You mean high school graduates can't do this task in general? You're right. What does that tell us about our education system? Well, it tells us that we need to think about the preparedness of our students as they are leaving high school. Right. And schools, employers, in fact, we all need to do something about it. Thank you, Gabriel. Questions 12 to 15 are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question 12. What does the man say about Americans? Question 13. Who performed the best in technology skills, according to the man? Question 14. In what aspect did American college students perform well? Question 15. What do we learn from the conversation about American high school education? Section C. Directions. In this section, you will hear three passages. At the end of each passage, you will hear three or four questions. Both the passage and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the center. Passage 1. Wild Carrots probably evolved with the other flowering plants about 360 million years ago. Like apples, carrots are native to Central Asia. That's why horses, which also come from Central Asia, like both apples and carrots so much. With wild carrots, the roots are white, small and skinny, so you'd have to pick a lot of wild carrots to get enough to eat. Doctors used carrot seeds and roots as medicine, on the theory that foods that taste bad must be good for you. Around 800 AD, people in Central Asia managed to develop a new kind of carrot, a purple carrot, that attracted more interest from international traders. Then, in the late 1500s, food scientists in the Netherlands cultivated large, straight, sweet, red carrots like the ones we eat today. But people still mostly fed carrots to horses, donkeys, and pigs, and didn't eat them themselves. In the 1600s, people in China used carrots as medicine, but they also ate carrots boiled in soup. The red color was popular for Chinese New Year celebrations. But carrots got their biggest boost during the two world wars, when food shortages forced people to eat them and governments told everyone how healthy carrots were. Today, cooler countries grow most of the world's carrots. Machines do most of the planting and picking, and carrots are easy to store and ship, so they are cheap almost everywhere. Questions 16 to 18 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 16. What do we learn from the talk about wild carrots?
Question seventeen: What does the speaker say about carrots in the late fifteen hundreds? Question eighteen: Why did people turn to carrots for food during the two world wars? Passage two: Catherine loved Facebook. With Facebook, she could stay connected with her family, no matter how far away they were. She could see their photos and read their status updates. With Facebook, she could keep her relatives up to date on what she was doing. Another thing Catherine loved about Facebook was that she didn't have to think about time zones when updating family. Whenever she called her parents or other relatives. She always had to think about the time difference so that she wouldn't wake someone up or call when she knew they were at church. Facebook was so convenient. When Catherine joined Facebook, some of her classmates at high school started to add her as a friend. At first, this didn't bother her. She loved learning about the success of people she knew when she was just a teenager. She loved finding out people were getting married. Having babies and traveling. Soon, however, Catherine found herself comparing herself with the people she was reading about on Facebook. It began to make her feel bad that some people seemed to be doing so much better than she was. She was also spending a lot of time on Facebook. It took a lot of time and energy to keep up with everyone's status updates. Catherine started to think. She looked at the list of over 500 friends she had on Facebook, and realized some of them were not really friends at all. Questions 19 to 21 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 19: What was one particular convenience Catherine loved about Facebook? Question twenty: How did Catherine feel when her classmates added her as a Facebook friend? Question twenty-one: What made Catherine feel bad about herself later on? Passage three. Do you know where a mule comes from? It is the child of a donkey and a horse. Mules have strong muscles like horses, but they eat less, can work longer, and are gentler like donkeys. George Washington was the first person in the United States to own mules. He had heard that mules made good farm animals, and he contacted the U.S. ambassador in Spain. To ask about them, in 1785, King Charles III of Spain sent Washington a male donkey as a gift. That male donkey became the father of the mule industry in the U.S. Every April, Murray County holds a Mule Day celebration. Held in Columbia, Tennessee, Mule Day had its beginning as Breeders' Day in the 1840s. Farmers and farm animal breeders would bring their animals to market every April to show, buy, and trade. This was an important business before the days of tractors, when many families made a living from farming, and mules were used as work animals. Eventually, tractors began to replace mules, making them less in demand. 
A parade was added to Mule Day in 1934 to attract more people. Over the years, other activities have been added, and today, more than 200,000 people show up each year to watch and participate. If you visit during Mule Day celebrations, you might see mule driving contests, square dances, horse shows, or even tree cutting competitions. Questions 22 to 25 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 22. What does the speaker say about mules? Question 23. What do we learn about the donkey which is said to be the father of the U.S. mule industry? Question 24. What did farmers usually do on Mule Day in the 1840s? Question 25. What made mules less in demand in America? This is the end of listening comprehension. College English Test, Band 4, Part 2, Listening Comprehension, Section A, Directions. In this section, you will hear three news reports. At the end of each news report, you will hear two or three questions. Both the news report and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the center. News Report 1. A nine-year-old girl in New Mexico has raised more than $500 for her little brother who needs heart surgery in Houston, Texas, this July. Addison Witulski's grandmother, Kim Allred, said... Addison probably overheard a conversation between family members talking about the funds needed to get her little brother to treatment. I guess she overheard her grandfather and me talking about how we are worried about how we are going to get to Houston for my grandson's heart surgery, said Allred. She decided to go outside and have a lemonade stand and make some drawings and pictures and sell them. That's when Addison and her friends... Erica and Emily Borden decided to sell lemonade for 50 cents a cup and sell pictures for 25 cents each. Before Allred knew it, New Mexico state police officers were among the many stopping by, helping them reach a total of $568. The family turned to social media, expressing their gratitude, saying, From the bottom of our hearts, we would like to deeply thank each and every person that stopped by. Questions 1 and 2 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 1. Who did Addison raise money for? Question 2. How did Addison raise money? News Report 2 Last week, France announced that the country will pave 621 miles of road with solar panels over the next five years 
with the goal of providing cheap, renewable energy to 5 million people. Called the Wattway, the roads will be built through joint efforts with the French road building company Colas and the National Institute of Solar Energy. The company spent the last five years developing solar panels that are only about a quarter of an inch thick and are strong enough to stand up to heavy highway traffic without breaking or making the roads more slippery. The panels are also designed so that they can be installed directly on top of existing roadways, making them relatively cheap and easy to install. France isn't the first country to kick around the idea of paving its roads with solar panels. In November 2015, the Netherlands completed a 229-foot-long bike path paved with solar panels as a test for future projects. However, this is the first time a panel has been designed to be laid directly on top of existing roads and the first project to install the panels on public highways. Questions 3 and 4 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 3. What was France's purpose of constructing the Wattway? Question 4. What is special about the solar panels used in the Wattway? News Report 3 Lions have disappeared from much of Africa, but for the past few years, scientists have wondered if the big cats were hanging on in remote parts of Sudan and Ethiopia. Continuous fighting in the region has made surveys difficult. But scientists released a report Monday documenting, with hard evidence, the discovery of lost lions. A team with Oxford University's Wildlife Conservation Research Unit, supported by a charity organisation, spent two nights in November camping in a national park in northwest Ethiopia on the Ethiopia Sudan border. The researchers set out six camera traps capturing images of lions and they identified lion tracks. The scientists concluded that lions are also likely to live in a neighbouring national park across the border in Sudan. The International Union for Conservation of Nature had previously considered the area a possible range for the species, and local people had reported seeing lions in the area, but no one presented convincing evidence. Questions 5 to 7 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 5. What has made it difficult to survey lions in remote parts of Sudan and Ethiopia? Question 6. What was the main purpose of the research? Question 7. What did the researchers find in the National Park? Section B. Directions. In this section, you will hear two long conversations. At the end of each conversation, you will hear four questions. Both the conversation and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the centre. Conversation 1 I bet you're looking forward to the end of this month. Aren't you? 
Yes, I am. How did you know? David told me you had a special birthday coming up. Oh, yes, that's right. This year will be my golden birthday. What does that mean? I've never heard of a golden birthday. I've actually just learned of this concept myself, fortunately, just in time to celebrate. A golden or lucky birthday is when one turns the age of their birth date. So, for example, my sister's birthday is December 9th and her golden birthday would have been the year she turned nine years old. Come to think of it, my parents did throw her a surprise party that year. Interesting. Too bad I missed mine. My golden birthday would have been four years ago. I assume you've got big plans then. Actually, yes. My husband is planning a surprise holiday for the two of us next week. I've no idea what he's got in mind, but I'm excited to find out. Has he mentioned anything to you? He might have. Anything you'd like to share? I'm dying to know what kind of trip he has planned or where we're going. You know nothing at all? Not a clue. Hard to imagine, isn't it? Though, I must say, I think he's been having even more fun keeping this secret from me the past few weeks. I'm sure both of you will have a fantastic time. Happy golden birthday. I can't wait to hear all about it when you get back. Questions 8 to 11 are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question 8. What is the woman looking forward to? Question 9. What did the woman's parents do on her sister's lucky birthday? Question 10. What is the woman eager to find out about? Question 11. What does the man say at the end of the conversation? Conversation 2. Mr. Green, what do you think makes a successful negotiator? Well, that's hard to define. But I think successful negotiators have several things in common. They are always polite and rational people. They are firm, but flexible. They can recognize power and know how to use it. They are sensitive to the dynamics of a negotiation, the way it rises and falls, and how it may change direction. They project an image of confidence. And, perhaps most importantly, they know when to stop. And what about an unsuccessful negotiator? Well, this is probably all of us when we start out. We are probably immature and over-trusting, too emotional or aggressive. We are unsure of ourselves, and we want to be liked by everyone. Good negotiators learn fast. Poor negotiators remain like that, and go on losing negotiations. In your opinion, can the skills of negotiation be taught? Well, you can teach someone how to prepare for negotiation. There are perhaps six stages in every negotiation. Get to know the other side. State your goals. Start the process. Clarify areas of disagreement or conflict. Reassess your position making acceptable compromises, and finally, reach some agreement in principle. These stages can be studied, and the strategies to be used in each can be planned beforehand. But I think the really successful negotiator is probably born with a sixth sense about responding appropriately to the situation at hand. 
the artistic sense you've just described? Yes, that's right. Questions 12 to 15 are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question 12. What does the man say about good negotiators? Question 13. What does the man say may be the most important thing to a successful negotiator? Question 14. How is a good negotiator different from a poor one? Question 15. What is the first stage of a negotiation, according to the man? Section C. Directions. In this section, you will hear three passages. At the end of each passage, you will hear three or four questions. Both the passage and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices, marked A, B, C and D. Then, mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1, with a single line through the centre. Passage 1. Some people wonder why countries spend millions of dollars on space projects. They want to know how space research helps people on Earth. Actually, space technology helps people on Earth every day. This is called spin-off technology. Spin-off technology is space technology that is now used on Earth. In early space programs, such as the Apollo missions of the 1960s and 1970s, and in the space shuttle missions today, Scientists developed objects for the astronauts to use on the moon and in space. We now use some of these objects every day. For example, we have quartz crystal clocks and watches accurate to within one minute a year. We purify the water we drink with a water filter designed for the astronauts use in space. The cordless Handheld tools we use in our homes, such as vacuum cleaners, flashlights, drills, and saws, came from the technology of these early space programs. On cold winter days, we can stay warm with battery-operated gloves and socks, and specially made coats and jackets. All of these clothes are similar to the spacesuit designs that kept astronauts comfortable in the temperatures of the moon and our spin-offs from space technology. These products are only a few examples of the many ways space technology helps us in our everyday lives. No one knows how new spin-off technology from the International Space Station will help us in the future. Questions 16 to 18 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 16. What do some people want to know about space exploration? Question 17. What did scientists do for the space shuttle missions? Question 18. What does the speaker say about quartz, crystal clocks and watches? Passage 2. Well, if I could go back in history and live, 
I'd like to go back to the 18th century and perhaps in colonial America, in Yankee New England, where one of my ancestors lived, because it was the beginning of something. By the 18th century, there was a feeling of community that had grown. My ancestor was a preacher travelling around the countryside. People lived in small communities. There were fishermen and farmers who provided fresh food that tasted and looked like food, unlike that in today's supermarkets. And there were small towns, and New York wasn't that far away. I'm deeply attached to the Puritan tradition, not in a religious sense, but they believed in working for something, working for goals, and I like that. They worked hard at whatever they did, but they had a sense of achievement. They believed in goodness, in community, in helping one another. I love the colonial fabrics, all the silver work, the furnishings, the combination of elegance and simplicity. I love it. The printing, the books, I'm very attached to all that kind of thing. It may not all be very entertaining in the modern sense of the word, but I would have enjoyed spending my evenings in that environment discussing new ideas, building a new world. And I can see myself sitting on a small chair by the fire doing needlework. Questions 19 to 21 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 19. Why does the speaker say she would like to go back and live in the 18th century America? Question 20. What does the speaker say about the Puritans? Question 21. What would the speaker like doing if she could go back to the past? Passage 3. If you are lost in the woods, a little knowledge can turn what some people call a hardship into an enjoyable stay away from the troubles of modern society. When you think you are lost, sit down on a log or a rock or lean against a tree and recite something that you have memorized to bring your mind to a point where it is under control. Don't run blindly. If you must move, don't follow a stream unless you know it, and in that case you are not lost. Streams normally flow through wetland before they reach a lake or a river. Though there are more eatable plants, there may also be wild animals, poisonous snakes, and other hazards. Many experts feel that it is wisest to walk uphill. At the top of most hills and mountains are trails leading back to civilization. If there are no trails, you are much easier to be seen on top of a hill, and you may even spot a highway or a railroad from this point. Nowadays, the first way someone will search for you is by air. In a wetland or in dense growth, you are very hard to spot. Any time you go into the woods, somebody should know where you are going and when you expect to return. Also, when someone comes looking, you should be able to signal to them. Questions 22 to 25 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 22. What does the speaker advise you to do first if you are lost in the woods? Question 23. What will happen if you follow an unknown stream in the woods? Question 
Question 24. What do many experts think is the wisest thing to do if you are lost in the woods? Question 25. What should you do before you go into the woods? This is the end of listening comprehension. College English Test, Band 4, Part 2, Listening Comprehension, Section A, Directions. In this section, you will hear three news reports. At the end of each news report, you will hear two or three questions. Both the news report and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the center. News Report 1 A New Jersey black bear that walks upright on its two back legs and has become a social media darling has re-emerged and has been captured on video months after its last sighting. The bear named Pedals, was spotted in the town of Oak Ridge. In a video posted to Facebook featuring the bear, it appeared to be in relatively good health and was moving quickly. Pedals apparently has an injured leg or paw that doesn't allow it to walk comfortably on all fours, according to experts. Lawrence Hadjner, spokesman for the State Department of Environmental Protection, said... Officials expect the bear to make it through next winter. The bear first gained fame after it was spotted wandering around neighbourhoods and was caught on videos that were posted on social media and shown on national television. Last year, supporters pushed for pedals to be moved to a shelter, but New Jersey officials have said they won't allow the bear to be captured and transferred to the facility. The bear would do better in its natural habitat and the agency would step in if its condition deteriorated, they said. Questions 1 and 2 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 1. What is the probable reason the bear walks upright on its back legs? Question 2. How is the bear first known to the public? News Report 2. It's not your imagination. Traffic in the U.S. is actually getting worse. Americans drove more miles last year than any other year on record. The U.S. Department of Transportation says Americans drove nearly 3,150 billion miles last year. That's about the same distance as 337 round trips from Earth to Pluto. The previous record was 3,003 billion miles in 2007 before the economic recession and high gas prices. The traffic increase comes at the same time as gas prices drop significantly. The current average gas price in the U.S. is $1.71 per gallon. A year ago, it was $2.31 per gallon and was often much higher in recent years. A transportation expert told the reporter that job growth likely plays a part as well, along with some people driving longer distances to and from work. And so, all this means more traffic jams on the road. The Texas A&M Travel Institute found that rush hour travelers spent an extra 42 hours on the road last year because of travel delays. Now, that is depressing. Questions 3 and 4 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 3. What new record did American drivers set last year?
Question 4. What is depressing, according to the speaker? News Report 3. A 16-year-old asked a stranger at a grocery store to buy him and his mother some food in exchange for carrying the man's groceries to his car. What happened next will pull at your heartstrings. A wonderful bond formed between the two and within a couple of weeks, the stranger, named White, helped raise $190,000 on a website to support the Memphis teenager and his disabled mother. When Chauncey approached me, it just pulled at my heart, White said. Here comes Chauncey, just trying to get food for him and his mom off the grace of other people. When I looked at him and saw what he was doing and what he was asking for, I said he was my hero. Chauncey is a top student who is doing his best to make it in a world with no money and very few resources. White explained on the crowdfunding site. He wants to work and help his mother financially. It's so rare that we get an opportunity to affect so much change on one life, White wrote. I cannot thank you enough for caring about Chauncey. This is his big chance and you're making it possible. Questions 5 to 7 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 5. What did the teenager Chauncey do at the grocery store to get some food? Question 6. What did the stranger do for Chauncey? Question 7. What do we learn about Chauncey? Section B. Directions. In this section, you will hear two long conversations. At the end of each conversation, you will hear four questions. Both the conversation and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C and D. Then, mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the centre. Conversation 1 That was my last economics lecture of the week. And here's the weekend again. What are you up to tonight? I was just wondering if we could try out the new restaurant on Charles Street, then go on to Queen Victoria for a drink. Sorry, I'm heading home this weekend for my brother's 18th birthday. Oh, that's great. All my relatives are going to be there, as well as my brother's horrible friends, of course. Listen, why don't you come along? Mum would be absolutely delighted to see you again. She's always asking after you. Yes, I'd love to see her too. So, please, do come. It'll be great. And besides, with Jonathan's wild gang to contend with, I'd really welcome an ally. That sounds tempting, but I won't be ready till five, as I've got my statistics seminar now. What time are you heading off? Well, I was going to leave right away. However, I can hang around for you if you like. It just means that I'll need to change my ticket. But would that be too much trouble for you? No, not at all. I'll go to the station first and see if I can get tickets for us on the 6.30 train. Then you can join me there. I'll text you when it's done. Brilliant. Are you absolutely positive it's OK? I wouldn't want to impose. Don't worry. You're most welcome to join our party. And, as I always say, the more the merrier. Look, I'd better go or I'll be late, so I'll meet you down at the station around six. Fine. See you later. Questions 8 to 11 are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question 8. 
What has the man just done? Question 9. What is the man going to do this weekend? Question 10. What does the man ask the woman to do? Question 11. How will they go to the man's home? Conversation 2. Hi, Jane. How's everything going? So far, so good. I've just finished my last exam. Good. The term is coming to an end. Do you think we should take a holiday overseas to relax and have fun? I've saved my tips for my waiter job these past few months, and I should have enough by July. Yes, that's a wonderful idea. I've got a little put aside for a rainy day, but I might need to earn a little more before we go. By the way, what's it like working in a restaurant? Well, it's really tough, as working a 10-hour shift is like hell. I'm not sure it'll suit you, but it's pretty cool if your boss is all right. Do you think we should invite some others to come along? Yes, we could ask Tom and Tracy if they're interested. I haven't been abroad for a long while, and it would be great to go somewhere by the sea. I can't wait. And, if Tom goes, we could go sailing. He has a lot of experience with boats and it'll work out a lot cheaper to hire one if there's more of us to share the cost. So, that's a plan. We'll save as much as we can and go sailing next July. Let's say Spain, but anywhere cheap will be fine. OK, but first we'd better contact Tom and Tracy and see if they are up for it. If not, it'll be back to the drawing board. Questions 12 to 15 are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question 12. What does the man think of doing? Question 13. What has the man been doing for the past few months? Question 14. What does the woman say she needs to do before departure? Question 15. Why does the woman want to invite Tom? Section C. Directions. In this section, you will hear three passages. At the end of each passage, you will hear three or four questions. Both the passage and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices, marked A, B, C and D. Then, mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet one, with a single line through the center. Passage one. Most people know Marie Curie was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize and the first person to win it twice. However, few people know that she was also the mother of a Nobel Prize winner. Irene Curie was born on September 12th, 1897. At the age of 10, Irene's talents 
and interest in mathematics were apparent. Irene entered Sorbonne University in October 1914 to prepare for a degree in mathematics and physics. When World War I began, she left Sorbonne University to help her mother, who was using X-ray facilities to help save the lives of wounded soldiers. Irene continued this work by developing X-ray facilities for military hospitals in France and Belgium. After the war, she received a military medal for her work. In 1918, Irene became her mother's assistant at the Curie Institute. In December 1924, Frederick Joliot visited the Institute where he met Marie Curie. Frederick became one of her assistants and Irene taught him the techniques required to work with radioactivity. Irene and Frederick soon fell in love and got married on October 29, 1926. Their daughter was born in 1927 and their son in 1932. Like her mother, Irene combined family with career. Like her mother, Irene was awarded a Nobel Prize along with her husband, Frederick, in 1935 for producing new radioactive elements. Unfortunately, also like her mother, she developed a blood cancer because of her exposure to radiation. Irene Joliot Curie died on March 17, 1956. Questions 16 to 18 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 16. What does the speaker say about Marie Curie's daughter? Question 17. For what was Irene Curie awarded a military medal? Question 18. In what way were Marie and Irene similar? Passage 2. Have you ever heard of the Vikings? They were sea travellers from Norway. More than a thousand years ago, they made three important geographical discoveries. The Vikings' first major discovery occurred in the 9th century. A man called Nadod was on his way from Norway to the Faroe Islands, north of England, when his ship was caught in a storm. The storm blew the ship west for several days. When the weather cleared, Nadod found himself on the coast of a new land. Later, Viking travellers named it Iceland. In 982, a Viking called Eric the Red sailed west in search of new land. 500 miles west of Iceland, he and his men reached an icy, rocky mass of land. They sailed around it until they reached the western side. Here they found some green areas, so they named the island Greenland. Then, in 1001, the Vikings made their most important discovery. The son of Eric the Red, named Leif Eriksson, had heard rumours about land west of Greenland. He sailed west and soon found it. He and his men landed in three places. They called the first one Heluland, which means land of flat stones. The Vikings then sailed south and made their second landing. They named this place Markland. Their third landing was at a place they called Vinland. Leif Eriksson and his men were the first Europeans to walk on the shores of North America, almost 500 years earlier than Columbus. Questions 19 to 21 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 19. What do we learn about the Vikings? Question 
Question 20. What does the passage say about Greenland? Question 21. What does the speaker mainly talk about? Passage 3. Where do you think you'll be in 10 years? It's difficult to know exactly where you'll be and what you'll be doing, but everyone dreams about the future. You might imagine the job you'll get when you finish school. You may daydream about meeting your life partner or living in a big house by the sea. In my dreams, I would have twins, a boy and a girl. We would live in a large two-story house with floors and a staircase made of wood. Now, at the age of 46, I look back on those dreams and smile. Things haven't turned out exactly as I imagined, but I wouldn't change what I have now for that imaginary world. In college, I studied international business and planned to enter law school. In my third year of university, I realized that I didn't want to become a lawyer. Instead, I chose to become a language teacher. I did get married, but had more than two children. We had five. Do I live in the dream house with wooden floors? No, I don't, but I love my home, and I wouldn't want to live in any other place. I believe that, as a young person, it's important to dream and make plans. However, it's also important to realize that not all of your plans will turn out exactly as you wish. One of the biggest lessons I've learned in life is this. Be happy with what you have. Questions 22 to 25 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 22. What does the speaker think everyone tends to do? Question 23. What does the speaker say he would refuse to do? Question 24. What did the speaker major in during the first two years of college? Question 25. What is one of the biggest lessons the speaker has learned in life? This is the end of listening comprehension. College English Test Band 4 Part 2. Listening Comprehension Section A. Directions In this section, you will hear three news reports. At the end of each news report, you will hear two or three questions. Both the news report and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the centre. News Report 1. A 16th century castle in Scotland is close to collapsing after lumps of soil were washed away by floods, threatening its foundations. On Sunday, the castle's owner, John Gordon, 76, was forced to move out of his property after the River Dee swept away about 60 feet of land, leaving the castle dangerously close to the river, 
according to the Scottish Daily Record. Abergeldy Castle, located in Aberdeenshire, Scotland, was built by Sir Alexander Gordon of Midmar, who later became the Earl of Huntley. The castle, which is located on eleven thousand seven hundred acres, was leased to members of the royal family between eighteen forty-eight and nineteen seventy, including King Edward the Seventh and George the Fifth. The Scottish Environment Protection Agency has issued more than thirty-five flood warnings covering several regions as Scotland continues to clean up after Storm Frank hit the country last Wednesday. This means that rivers will rise more slowly, but then stay high for much longer. The environmental agency said. Questions one and two are based on the news report you have just heard. Question one. Why did John Gordon move out of Abergeldy Castle? Question two: What happened in Scotland last Wednesday? News report two. Rescue efforts were underway Thursday morning for seventeen miners who were stuck in an elevator below ground at Cargill Rock Salt Mine near Lansing, New York, according to Marcia Lynch, public information officer with Tompkins County's Emergency Response Department. Emergency workers have made contact with the miners via a radio, and they all appear to be uninjured, said Jessica Verfus. The emergency department's assistant director. Crews have managed to provide heat packs and blankets to the miners, so that they can keep warm during the rescue operation. Vervas said. Details about what led to the workers being trapped in the elevator weren't immediately available. The mine along New York's Cayuga Lake processes salt used for road treatment. It produces about two million tons of salt that is shipped. To more than fifteen hundred places in the northeastern United States, the rock salt mine is one of three operated by Cargill, with the other two in Louisiana and Ohio. Questions three and four are based on the news report you have just heard. Question three: What does the news report say about the salt miners? Question four: What did the rescue team do? News report three: The U.S. Postal Service announced today that it is considering closing about three thousand seven hundred post offices. Over the next year, because of falling revenues, facing an $8.3 billion budget deficit this year, closing post offices is one of several proposals the Postal Service has put forth recently to cut costs. Last week, for example, Postmaster General Pat Donahoe announced plans to stop mail delivery on Saturdays, a move he says could save $3 billion annually. We are losing revenue as we speak," Donahoe said. "We do not want taxpayer money. We want to be self-sufficient. So, like any other business, you have to make choices." Dean Granholm, the vice president for delivery and post office operations, said the first wave of closings would begin this fall. He estimated that about three thousand postmasters. Five hundred station managers and between five hundred and one thousand postal clerks could lose their jobs. Questions five to seven are based on the news report you have just heard. Question five: What is the U.S. Postal Service planning to do?
Question six: What measure has been planned to save costs? Question seven: What will happen when the proposed measure comes into effect? Section B, directions. In this section, you will hear two long conversations. At the end of each conversation, you will hear four questions. Both the conversation and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet one, with a single line through the center. Conversation one. Mrs. Hampton, we've got trouble in the press room this morning. Oh dear! What about? One of the press operators arrived an hour and a half late. But that's a straightforward affair. He'll simply lose part of his pay. That's why we have a clock-in system. But the point is, the man was clocked in at eight o'clock. We have John standing by the time clock, and he swears he saw nothing irregular. Is John reliable? Yes, he is. That's why we chose him for the job. Have you spoken to the man who was late? Not yet. I thought I'd have a word with you first. He's a difficult man, and I think there's been some trouble on the shop floor. I've got a feeling that a trade union representative is behind this. The manager told me that Jack Green's been very active around the shop the last few days. Well, what do you want me to do? I was wondering if you'd see Smith, the man who was late, because you're so much better at handling things like this. Oh, all right, I'll see him. I must say I agree with you about there being bad feelings in the works. I've had the idea for some time that Jack Green's been busy stirring things up in connection with the latest wage claim. He's always trying to make trouble. Well, I'll get the manager to send Smith up here. Questions eight to eleven are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question eight: What will happen to the press operator who is late for work, according to the woman? Question nine. What does the man say about John, who stands by the time clock? Question ten: Why does the man suggest the woman see the worker who was late? Question eleven: What does the woman say about Jack Green? Conversation two. Our topic today is about something that foreigners nearly always say when they visit Britain. It's why are the British so cold? And they're talking about the British personality, the famous British Reserve. It means that we aren't very friendly. We aren't very open. So, do you think it's true? It's a difficult one. So many people who visit Britain say it's difficult to make friends with British people. They say we're cold, reserved, unfriendly. I think it's true. Look at Americans or Australians. They speak the same language, but they're much more open. And you see it when you travel. People, I mean strangers, speak to you on the street or on the train. British people seldom speak on the train or the bus. Not in London, anyway. Not in London. That's it. Capital cities are full of tourists and are never friendly. People are different in other parts of the country. Not completely. 
I met a woman once, an Italian. She'd been working in Manchester for two years, and no one, not one of her colleagues, had ever invited her to their home. They were friendly to her at work, but nothing else. She couldn't believe it. She said that would never happen in Italy. You know what they say: an Englishman's home is his castle. It's really difficult to get inside. Yeah, it's about being private. You go home to your house and your garden, and you close the door. It's your place. That's why the British don't like flats. They prefer to live in houses. That's true. Questions twelve to fifteen are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question twelve: What do foreigners generally think of British people, according to the woman? Question thirteen: What may British people typically do on a train, according to the man? Question fourteen: What does the man say about the Italian woman working in Manchester? Question fifteen: Why do British people prefer houses to flats? Section C: Directions. In this section, you will hear three passages. At the end of each passage. You will hear three or four questions. Both the passage and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet one with a single line through the center. Passage one. In college. Time is scarce and consequently very precious. At the same time, expenses in college pile up surprisingly quickly. A part-time job is a good way to balance costs while ensuring there's enough time left over for both academic subjects and after-class activities. If you're a college student looking for a part-time job, the best place to start your job search is right on campus. There are tons of on-campus job opportunities, and as a student, you will automatically be given hiring priority. Plus, on-campus jobs eliminate commuting time, and can be a great way to connect with academic and professional resources at your university. Check with your school's careers service or employment office for help to find a campus job. Of course. There are opportunities for part-time work off campus too. If you spend a little time digging for the right part-time jobs, you'll save yourself time when you find a job that leaves you with enough time to get your schoolwork done too. If you're a college student looking for work but worried you won't have enough time to devote to academic subjects, consider working as a study hall or library monitor. Responsibilities generally include supervising study spaces to ensure that a quiet atmosphere is maintained. It's a pretty easy job, but one with lots of downtime, which means you'll have plenty of time to catch up on reading, do homework, or study for an exam. Questions sixteen to eighteen are based on the passage you have just heard. Question sixteen. What does the speaker say about college students applying for on-campus jobs? Question seventeen: 
What can students do to find a campus job, according to the speaker? Question 18. What does the speaker say is a library monitor's responsibility? Passage 2. Agriculture workers in green tea fields near Mount Kenya are gathering the tea leaves. It is beautiful to see. The rows of tea bushes are straight. All appears to be well, but the farmers who planted the bushes are worried. Nelson Kibara is one of them. He has been growing tea in the Kurugoya area for 40 years. He says the prices this year have been so low that he has made almost no profit. He says he must grow different kinds of tea if he is to survive. Mr. Kibara and hundreds of other farmers have been removing some of their tea bushes and planting a new kind of tea developed by the Tea Research Foundation of Kenya. Its leaves are purple and brown. When the tea is boiled, the drink has a purple color. Medical researchers have studied the health benefits of the new tea. They say it is healthier than green tea and could be sold for a price that is three to four times higher than the price of green tea. But Mr. Kibara says he has not received a higher price for his purple tea crop. He says the market for the tea is unstable, and he is often forced to sell his purple tea for the same price as green tea leaves. He says there are not enough buyers willing to pay more for the purple tea. Questions 19 to 21 are based on the passage you have just heard. Question 19. Why have tea farmers in Kenya decided to grow purple tea? Question 20. What do researchers say about purple tea? Question 21. What has Mr. Kibara found about purple tea? Passage 3. Today's consumers want beautiful handcrafted objects to wear and to have for their home environment. They prefer something unique and they demand quality. Craftsmen today are meeting this demand. People and homes are showing great change as more and more unique handcrafted items become available. Handicrafts are big business. No longer does a good craftsman have to work in a job he dislikes all day and then try to create at night. He has earned his professional status. He is now a respected member of society. Part of the fun of being a craftsman is meeting other craftsmen. They love to share their ideas and materials and help others find markets for their work. Craftsmen have helped educate consumers to make wise choices. They help them become aware of design and technique. They help them relate their choice to its intended use. They often involve consumers in trying the craft themselves. When a group of craftsmen expands to include more members, a small craft organization is formed. Such an organization does a lot in training workshops in special media, crafts marketing techniques, crafts fairs and sales, festivals, TV appearances and demonstrations. State art councils help sponsor local arts and crafts festivals, which draw crowds of tourist consumers. This boosts the local economy considerably 
because tourists not only buy crafts, but they also use the restaurants and hotels and other services of the area. Questions twenty-two to twenty-five are based on the passage you have just heard. Question twenty-two: What does the speaker say about today's consumers? Question twenty-three. What does a speaker say about good craftsmen in the past? Question twenty-four: What do craftsmen help consumers do? Question twenty-five: Why do state art councils help sponsor local arts and crafts festivals? This is the end of listening comprehension. College English Test Band Four. Part two, listening comprehension, section A, directions. In this section, you will hear three news reports. At the end of each news report, you will hear two or three questions. Both the news report and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet one, with a single line through the center. News report one: New York State plans to shut off the thundering waters of Niagara Falls again, at least the American side of the falls. This once-in-a-lifetime event actually may take place twice in some folks' lives. The New York State Parks System wants to turn off the falls on the American side sometime in the next two to three years, to replace two 115-year-old stone bridges that allow pedestrians, park vehicles, and utilities access to Goat Island. The American side of the falls was shut off in 1969 to study the buildup of rock at the base of the falls. When that happened, people came from all over the world to see the falls turned off. People are curious by nature; they want to see what's underneath. In fact, those who first came to have a look did see something. They found millions of coins on the bottom. Questions one and two are based on the news report you have just heard. Question one: Why does New York State want to turn off Niagara Falls? Question two: What did people find? When Niagara Falls was shut off in 1969. News report two: The Tunisian government said Monday that 45 people had been killed after gunmen attacked a town near the border with Libya. The Interior and Defence Ministries said that the Tunisian government has closed its two border crossings with Libya because of the attack. The Tunisian military has sent reinforcements and helicopters to the area, and authorities have been hunting several attackers who are still at large. The violence came amid increasing international concern about Islamic State extremists in Libya. Officials of the Tunisian government. Are especially worried 
after dozens of tourists were killed in the attacks in Tunisia last year. Defence Minister Farhat Horchani said last week that German and American security experts were expected to come to help Tunisia devise a new electronic video supervision system on its border with Libya. Tunisia was targeted last year by three attacks that left 70 people dead and were claimed by Islamic State. Questions 3 and 4 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 3. What did the Tunisian government do after the gunmen's attack? Question 4. What were German and American security experts expected to do in Tunisia? News Report 3. Three university students in Santiago, Chile, have developed a plant-powered device to charge their mobile phones. The three engineering students got the idea for the device while sitting in their school's courtyard. Their invention is a small biological circuit they call e -kaya. It captures the energy which plants produce during photosynthesis a process of converting sunlight into energy. A plant uses only a small part of the energy produced by that process. The rest goes into the soil. E. Kaya collects that energy. The device plugs into the ground and then into a mobile phone. The E. Kaya solves two problems for the engineering students. They needed an idea for a class project. They also needed an outlet to plug in their phones. One of the student inventors, Camelia Ripchik, says the device changes the energy released from the plant into low-level power to charge phones. The e -Kaya is able to fully recharge a mobile phone in less than two hours. Questions 5 to 7 are based on the news report you have just heard. Question 5. What did the three university students invent? Question 6. When did they get the idea for the invention? Question 7. What does the speaker say about the invention? Section B. Directions. In this section, you will hear two long conversations. At the end of each conversation, you will hear four questions. Both the conversation and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter on answer sheet 1 with a single line through the center. Conversation 1. Good morning. What can I do for you? Good morning. Could I talk to Jeffrey Harding, please? Speaking. Hello, Jeff. It's Helen. I got your message on the answering machine. What's the problem? Oh, Helen. Well, it's the Grimsby plant again, I'm afraid. The robots on line three have gone wrong, and the line's at a standstill. Can't you replace them with the stand-ins? I'm afraid not. The stand-ins are already in use on line six, and the ones from line six are being serviced. When did this happen, Jeff? Well, they've been making a low, continuous sound for a day or two. 
but they finally went dead at two thirty this afternoon. I see. What did you do? Have you tried the whole plant? Not yet, Helen. I thought I'd better get your okay first. Okay. Get on the phone to Tom and try to get their stand-ins over tonight. We have to be back at full capacity tomorrow morning. Is it a major job to repair our robots? About a week. That's what the maintenance engineer says. Right. Well, if you can get the ones from Hull, please ask Tom to inform Sheffield that he may need their stand-ins in case of emergency during the next week. Okay. Thank you very much, Helen. You're most welcome. Sorry to spoil your day off. It doesn't matter. Questions eight to eleven are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question eight: What did the man do before the telephone conversation? Question nine: What does the man say about line three in the Grimsby plant? Question ten: What is the man's purpose in calling the woman? Question eleven: Where is the woman at the time of the conversation? Conversation two. This is Carrie Burke from New York Daily News. I'm speaking to Delroy Simmons, an unemployed Brooklyn man who missed a job interview Tuesday for the best of reasons. He was saving the life of a nine-month-old boy who was blown into the path of an oncoming subway train by a high wind. Everybody is making me out to be some sort of superhero. I'm just an ordinary person and a father of two. Anybody in that situation would have done what I did. You were going to an interview when the incident occurred, right? Yes, I was on my way to apply for a maintenance position. I've been looking for a job for a year and more. I'm looking for something to support my family. Tell us what happened at the station. There was a strong wind. It had to be thirty to forty miles an hour. There was a woman with four kids. One was in a pushchair. The wind blew the baby onto the tracks. Witnesses said people were looking on in horror as a child's mother, identified by sources as Maria Zamara, stood frozen in shock. In the distance, people could see the train rounding a bend, headed into the station. I guess you were not aware of any of these, right? No, I just jumped down and grabbed the baby. The train was coming around the corner as I lifted the baby from the tracks. I really wasn't thinking. What an amazing story! Thank you very much. Questions twelve to fifteen are based on the conversation you have just heard. Question twelve: What did Kerry Burke from New York Daily News say about the man? Question thirteen: What do we learn about the man from the conversation? Question fourteen: What caused the incident? Question fifteen: How did the mother react when the incident occurred?
Section C. Directions. In this section, you will hear three passages. At the end of each passage, you will hear three or four questions. Both the passage and the questions will be spoken only once. After you hear a question, you must choose the best answer from the four choices marked A, B, C, and D. Then mark the corresponding letter. On answer sheet one, with a single line through the center. Passage one. There's one sound that gets a big reaction from kids on a hot day, the sound of an ice cream truck. Maria McCartney has been in the mobile ice cream business since 2005. When I was a little girl, I saw an ice cream truck and knew I wanted to have one some day. McCartney said. During the hot days of summer. Maria and her daughter drive an ice cream truck through neighborhoods and parks in Billings. It's not about making money for this former elementary school teacher; rather, she wants to preserve the tradition of the neighborhood ice cream truck. Truly, my favorite part is to see the kids jumping up and down, and they just get so excited. It's great to build a memory for them too. There's not a lot of these ice cream trucks around anymore. The parents come out barefoot and screaming, ready to buy ice cream. They remember when they were kids and they saw a truck. She said. While the treats may be ice cold, Maria has a warm heart for little faces. Her truck features a donation bucket for kids who don't have money for ice cream. When there are three kids and only two of them have money, I always make sure the third one gets something because I can't drive away. And have that third one not have something? She said. Questions sixteen to eighteen are based on the passage you have just heard. Question sixteen: What does the speaker say about Maria McCartney? Question seventeen: Why does Maria go into the mobile ice cream business? Question eighteen: Why does Maria put a donation bucket in her truck? Passage two. We know we have to pay for what we get. If we buy food, we have to pay for it. If a doctor treats us, we know there will be a bill to pay. These are private bills, but there are also public bills to be paid. They are paid by the government. In turn, we get the needed services. We pay for these services through taxes. What would happen if everyone stopped paying taxes? The water supply would stop. The streets might not be cleaned. Schools would be closed. We would not want to live in such a city. The chief duty of every government is to protect persons and property. More than three fourths of government expenses are used for this purpose. The next largest amount of public money goes to teach and train our citizens. Billions of dollars each year. Are spent on schools and libraries. Also, a large amount of public funds is spent on roads. Most of the needed funds is raised by taxes. The law orders us to pay taxes. We have no choice in the matter. Years ago, the government made money by selling public lands, but most of the best public lands have now been sold. There are still some public lands that contain oil. Coal and other natural resources, they could be sold, but we want to save them for future years. So we all must pay our share for the services that make our lives comfortable. Questions nineteen to twenty-one are based on the passage you have just heard. Question nineteen: What does the speaker mainly talk about?
Question twenty: What is most of the government money used for? Question twenty one: How did the government raise money to pay public bills in the past? Passage three. Did you know that besides larger places like France and Germany, Europe is home to several extremely tiny countries? One of these countries contains less than a square mile of land. Another is surrounded on all sides by Italy. Yet each is an independent land with its own government, trade, and customs. One of the best known of these small countries is Monaco. It is situated on the Mediterranean Sea and surrounded by France on three sides. Monaco became familiar to Americans when its ruler, Prince Rainier. Married the American actress Grace Kelly, Rainier's family has ruled Monaco almost continuously since 1297. The land has been independent for over 300 years. Andorra, with an area of some 200 square miles, is considerably larger than Monaco. This country is located in the Pyrenees Mountains, with France on one side and Spain on the other. Potatoes and tobacco are grown in Andorra's steep mountain valleys. One of the products it exports is clothing. Andorra is also known for its excellent skiing locations. Within the Alps in Central Europe is Liechtenstein, a tiny country of about thirty thousand people who speak mostly German. Liechtenstein uses the same money as its neighbour Switzerland, but it has been an independent country since the eighteen sixties. Taxes are low, so many businesses have their headquarters here. The country makes and exports a lot of machinery. Other small independent states in Europe are San Marino and Luxembourg. Each of these has unique qualities as well. Questions twenty-two to twenty-five are based on the passage you have just heard. Question twenty-two: What does the speaker say about Monaco? Question twenty-three: Why did Monaco become familiar to Americans, according to the speaker? Question twenty-four: What is one of the products Andorra exports? Question twenty five: What does the speaker mainly talk about? This is the end of listening comprehension.